moving faster than ever before. Services sector. The most resilient industry. The first ABSL summit in Moldova. Untapped near shoring destination. Good morning, Kishinev. Good morning, dear participants of the ABSL Summit. My name is Andrei Krigan, and I'm very honored to be the moderator of this uh, summit, Moldova, the untapped near shoring destination. I would also like to mention that today we welcome also the participation of His Excellency the Prime Minister, State Secretaries, representatives of the development partners of Moldova, which needs their support. I'm very happy also to be at this summit, at the first edition, because I'm also representing the business services sector. And I know I understand how important it is and what value we can create for Moldova and for our development. Today we have... Uh, Full day agenda, very busy, a lot of discussions, plenty of room to debate. And um, as you may see from the agenda, we'll have the Simon Festive opening, then we'll have space to have a general overview of the business services sector. We will follow, to, we will discuss also about the future trends in the business sector. We will also touch the main of its assets, the workforce, how do we develop it. We'll have a little break for lunch around one o'clock. And we will discuss also with successful representatives of this sector from Moldova of how they succeed in this sector. We will also have some keynote speakers, international experts that will share their experience and their vision. And we will try to have a to-do for our future plan for the next summit. For the summit festive opening, I'm very honored to invite the first speaker his Excellency, the Prime Minister of the Republic of Moldova, Mr. Dorin Rechan. Please welcome him. Works. Uh, I saw the um, beginning of this uh, presentation and uh, I think we have to acknowledge that the world is not changing, but it changed already quite a lot. And in changed, it changed in a way that provides now with a lot of opportunities uh, because of the development of the connectivity and because of the very low cost of communications that we have uh, right now. Five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, it was not possible. This creates a lot of opportunities for virtualization of the uh, work environment, virtualization of the workspace, virtualization of the business uh, itself. Um, I know in this business Olivier, he is here. I saw uh, his, um, um, how to say, evolution uh, uh, here. And I think he would confirm that the world indeed changed. Now there are many more opportunities. Uh, I would like to stay with you, at least uh, until lunch, to have the lunch as well. <laughs> uh, but I wanted to welcome the development of this industry in uh, Moldova. I consider my participation at this uh, summit as an uh, invitation for the government to make the industry an offer. And the uh, government makes an offer to the uh, industry uh, to be part of a flat tax um, uh, development uh, platform like uh, IT Park, um, Park is. Uh, there is one catch there. 
the services should be, uh, should be um, delivered uh, for export, and I think it's uh, only, only fear. I'll tell you that the government also has a, you know, a national interest into uh, this, not only taps into the existing um, labor market in, in Moldova, but also we think this is a great opportunity, your industry is a great opportunity for our diaspora. Because with the current technologies, with the virtualizations of the, uh, of the um, development platform that the government has now, with the digitalization, we can tap our diaspora and having them working uh, for the Moldovan companies without changing the uh, re residence. So they can be still in Italy, they can still be in Germany, UK, wherever on the planet, or just on a beach in, in, um, in uh, I don't know, uh, Bali or whatever, and still working for a Moldovan company uh, producing GDP uh, for uh, our uh, government. Uh, now the government is on its way to address these uh, issues of taxation with the, uh, with the uh, countries of residence of our uh, diaspora, particularly in uh, European uh, Union and uh, UK. And I'm confident that very soon we'll have a structured approach for tapping in the, uh, the uh, diaspora here. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to, uh, to mention, that the government will support the, uh, the uh, industry. Uh, we have the universities that are very keen uh, to help high-value-added uh, jobs, creating those uh, jobs and providing the necessary uh, education. And, I, and uh, I'm confident that the industry and the university will achieve that, uh, that uh, synergy. So, let's work hard. Thank you, Your Excellency, Mr. Prime Minister, for this um, supportive message. And for this partner offer, I think it's a very interesting point you've touched there. And actually, I find myself in the same position, as you mentioned, that we can bring our diaspora, our students back Actually, we have a colleague that works from abroad for us, has a company here and pays all its taxes here. So basically, that's a very good point. They can be anywhere, but they can work in Moldova, pay their taxes in Moldova here, and maybe, I hope very much, we can bring them back also physically for more days here or forever maybe. Thank you, Mr. Prime Minister. We are continuing our festive opening, and I would like to invite for a welcome speech the State Secretary from the Ministry of Economic Development and Digitalization of Moldova, Mr. Viorel Garaz. Please welcome him. Dear Mr. Prime Minister, ladies and gentlemen, it's an honor to stand before you today as a State Secretary of Ministry of Economic Development and Digitalization of uh, Republic of Moldova at the opening of uh, Moldova and taped near Sharing Destination Summit. I would like to extend a warm welcome to all our distinguished guests and the participants. We are gathered here today to discuss a huge potential that Moldova holds as an untapped near sharing destination. As a nation, we fully understand that uh, challenges we face due to a shortage of uh, skilled laborers. However, we are equally aware of the vast opportunities that lie before us, especially when it comes to harnessing the potential for our high-skilled uh, workforce from uh, Moldova. Recently, as Mr. Prime Minister mentioned, our government initiated an uh, innovative project that will include BPO services within the IT Park framework. With this, uh, uh, with move, this move to it's designed to capitalize an enormous advantage that this sector offers, and to uh, bolster businesses' services too in, here in Moldova. 
In addition, we have already approved legislation that uh, eases the process for Moldovan businesses to attract qualified workforce from European Union and soon from other countries as well. We are committed to simplify reporting system, optimizing our tax framework, reducing bureaucratic obstacles and facilitating access to affordable financing to stimulate businesses and develop within our borders. We understand that creating a favorable uh, environment for businesses uh, to thrive in paramount is a paramount to our economic growth. We also recognize the importance of uh, fostering international collaborations and partnerships to make Moldova a compelling, nurturing destination. This summit is a testament to our commitments to innovations, growth and collaboration. We look forward to fruitful discussions today, valuable insights and concrete actions that will not only benefit Moldova, but also fortify our connections with international business communities. Together, we can unlock the untaped potential Moldova potential of Moldova as a nearshoring destination and create a, a prosperous future for our uh, nation. Thank you and let's work together for a brighter tomorrow. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. State Secretary, for the detailization of this partner offer for the business and services sector. It's very important and thank you for your supporting words as well. I would like to invite uh, for the festive opening the next speaker, the director of the Swiss Cooperation Office in Moldova, Mr. Guido Beltrani. Please welcome him. State Secretary, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very glad to be here with you today at this very first uh, summit uh, and this uh, beautiful initiative of the Moldovan Association of Business Services. And it's also great to see so many interested participants here. I think that these initiatives are very, very much needed to strengthen the linkages among all actors, both within the private sector, but we have here also the, the public sector. We have heard interesting offers from the governmental side and this kind of connection and dialogue is very, very beneficial for the business process outsourcing uh, sector. Moldova indeed is a, an attractive destination for outsourcing of business services and nearshoring operations thanks to its, obviously, uh, thanks to its proximity to the European market. European companies can easily establish here uh, business process outsourcing or shared service centers, capitalizing on the benefits of skilled labors that uh, we have here in Moldova, cost efficiency, and also cultural alignment. Moreover, the digital transformation is also helping in this process. It is reshaping business strategies, our lifestyles, and also the global value chains. And this is a great opportunity for this sector also to become part uh, of these global value chains, uh, linking in particular with European and US markets. Switzerland proudly supports and will continue to support the growth of the sector and also Moldova's digital transformation journey. We are also confident that the recently signed free trade agreement between uh, the Republic of Moldova and the EFTA, the European Free Trade Association, of, of which Switzerland is one out of four country members, will lead to a further growth in bilateral trade, bilateral trade and investments between our countries. And it is also worthwhile mentioning that this ambitious agreement covers a wide range of um, topics and for the first time also uh, the topic of e-commerce, which might be of interest also uh, to the member of your industry. 
Business services do not only benefit uh, and contribute to an accelerated digital transformation, they are also a significant generator of employment, and we have heard that it is important also to create employment, to offer opportunities for young people to be employed and stay here. And uh, it's great to see that your sector, business, process, outsourcing companies, shared service centers provide job opportunity to a skilled workforce graduating from not less, I was told, not less than 29 different higher education institutions. With the support of the Swiss government and GIZ, uh, the young but already powerful association of business service leaders is greatly contributing to development of the business services in Moldova. And uh, I, want to, I would like to congratulate them again for that. This summit is an excellent platform for presenting the successes that you have already achieved and also to share best practices and uh, in the end to promote Moldova as an attractive and competitive country. On this journey, you can continue to count on the partnership with Switzerland. Thank you, Mulțumesc. We say thank you, Mr. Beltrani, for you to Switzerland for being um, one of the strategic partners for ABSL Summit and supporting the industry a lot. And um, thank you for the supportive words and for your message. Uh, for the next uh, welcome speech, I would like to invest, in, invite um, Mr. Olivier Prado, the president of ABSL Moldova. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I am deeply honored to stand before you today as the president of ABSL Moldova representing the business process outsourcing and business services sector in Moldova. I want to extend my gratitude to each and every one of you for being with us today here at the occasion of this first summit. Before I dive into the current state of business service sector in Moldova, I would like to take a moment to reflect on the past. Once upon a time, when I first set foot in Moldova in the early 20s, 2000, sorry, there was no outsourcing industry to speak of. Moldova had only a few company, ITO companies. It was a different era, a time when the potential of this sector was yet to be fully realized. With the release of the famous book of Thomas Friedman in 2005, The World is Flat, this literal flat world concept became a reality. And many companies and many countries, starting with India and then some, re some countries of the region, understood this revolution and its consequences. Fast forward 20 years and we are here today. Moldova has begun to embrace the opportunities presented in, the, this, in this trend, by this trend especially in ITO. ITO developed very strongly, as you know, especially in the, in the 2007, 8, 9, 10, when we created ATIC, the ICT Association. We got tech wheel, we got the fiscal facilities. But I would like to remind all of you that ITO is a business process outsourcing. An ITO needs an ecosystem in which it can develop. They need tech support, they need accounting support, they need HR support, they need translation support. And this is exactly the sector we at BSL are representing. So we need each other and we are complementary. This is what this government, as you heard before, understood clearly. And I would like to thank you them very much for this. Prime Minister has left, but I had the chance to tell him and to, uh, to thank him very much, as well as the Minister of Economy, the Minister of Finance for their support in obtaining these fiscal facilities. 
because we are facing a global competition. Now we have plenty of countries entering the race, even in Africa, everywhere in the world, not only the classical countries that we know, Philippines, India, Eastern Europe, but also many other ones. And we need this support. It's vital for us in order to develop. But the government also needs us because we are the industry which is able to provide good jobs for young people and to try to keep them home. So, again, we have a lot of thanks to, to address the, the, this government for understanding this and continuing uh, what the previous government started with IT. I would like to express a heartfelt thanks to all the stakeholders uh, that have played an instrumental role in supporting our association and the sector as a whole, with a special recognition for GIZ and its significant contribution for a long, long time. I would also like to acknowledge the members of ABSL Moldova. Your commitment is invaluable, and we hope to welcome even more companies into our fold in the near futures. Challenges lie ahead. But if we can act collectively and in unity, we can achieve even greater results than what we have already achieved in two years. Sincere uh, appreciation goes out to my colleagues. I don't see her, but especially Di Diana Perju, whose dedication has made all this possible. We must also recognize the support of the network ABSL, and in particular, ABSL Poland, which is represented today by Pavel. Your collaboration is essential to shape, in shaping our journey ahead. Thank you, Pavel. So, at the occasion of this first forum, we decided to focus on Moldova. The opportunities that we are offering in the countries, the challenges that we are facing, and, uh, of course, the fact that we are, as, as my predecessor explained, a nearshore destination, close from uh, Europe, close on the market. This is what we wanted to focus. This is what we are going to speak today about. And I wish you a very good journey today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. President Olivier Pradon. I would like to welcome the next uh, speaker with a festive uh, opening remarks, the Head of Department for Economic Cooperation of the German Embassy, Mr. Stefan Lohmann. Please welcome him. Good morning. Uh, what more to add, but I will, uh, I'm glad to say a few words on behalf of the German Embassy, who together with our Swiss colleagues, Guido, indeed uh, finances the GIZ support to the industry, and uh, not only uh, starting uh, today, but for many years already. So I'm happy to congratulate ABSL um, to this initiative, together with its partners, Invest Moldova Agency, and I hope uh, that this bringing together of the many, many actors here today is not, not uh, the last occasion, but the start of a tradition. So let this not be the last summit that you initiate. Um, I'm also glad to see us quite some companies here, including I heard some from Germany. Of course, that's, that's good to hear for someone from the German embassy. As a German corporation, we support this initiative because we believe that indeed it is important to have such fora to um, create a platform to connect with local partners, organizations, fostering the interaction and uh, lead the way to future collaborations. I heard that uh, the Association of Moldova is still quite young, and of course there are a couple of examples in Central Eastern Europe, so I'm really glad that also those representatives are here, and maybe they can show also an example that uh, where the Moldovan uh, sector can develop one day. The promotion of economic development, indeed, as I said, is one of the top priorities of the, of the government. Mr. State Secretary uh, kindly pointed this out, and it has been a priority of German Moldovan cooperation for many years now. But Germany is, of course, aware of the challenging economic situation that Moldova is in, um, not least because of Russia's war against Ukraine and the consequences, I think, that is felt by both the Moldovan people but the economy 
in particular. Um, Germany is therefore glad to support today's event also as a signal, uh, as a signal to that Moldova is resilient, that is open and can digitally transform and uh, can create a market with promising uh, prospects for future businesses and investors that want to come to Moldova. Um, clearly, it has been pointed out, and many of you might this know much better uh, than I do, Moldova has a promising position for the near -shoring, uh, as a nearshoring destination with its location, a skilled workforce, a very well uh, built connectivity infrastructure that we might sometimes even envy from a German perspective. And indeed, there have been a number of success stories. So um, I've asked uh, before, uh, when we received the invitation, like whether the organizers or GIZ could share some success stories in the sector. And I was, I was happy there are quite some from services fostering environmental sustainability, from uh, services to find parts in the automotive sector, of course, IT services, also real estate marketing. So there seem to be many, many occasions where Moldova as a nearshoring destination can add at value. We want to accompany this development as, as German cooperation um, through support of national partners like uh, the Organization for the Development of Entrepreneurship, ODA, or Moldova Invest, through the cooperation with many business, business associations like, like LBSL, policy expertise to the central government, of course, building on the interaction like today, but also uh, on the communication with the sector, so uh, being close to the business, uh, business sector. And we are very much also have an interest in career promotion, also for vulnerable groups of the population, including those that fled the war in Ukraine. Ultimately, our goal is, and I think we share this with the current government, to improve the livelihood of the people here in Moldova, to build Moldova at home, as uh, many here always say, and to create high-value added jobs in this country, and ultimately to accompany Moldova on its way to the European Union. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lohmann, for, the, for your supporting words and thank you for uh, the German cooperation initiative implemented by GIZ and thank you for being a strategic partner also uh, for the ABSL summit and for the business sectors, uh, services sector in particular. We are also happy to have uh, here with us members of the parliament and I would like to invite um, Marina Morozova for the welcome speech member of the Parliament, Committee on Economy, Budget and Finance, an active supporter of the industry and representative, former representative of the business sector. Thank you. Dear ladies, dear gentlemen, I am very pleased to be part of this event and I want to thank all actors for organizing this business summit. It is a great contribution in promoting business opportunities of our country. A priority of uh, the Parliament of, and for the government is economic growth. And all policies are oriented in this field. This aim cannot be realized without business services. And this is why we are here and to discuss and find solutions to help this sector. Business services is about potentials of this sector to stimulate economic growth and create new opportunities. It is about investors promoting local companies. It is about accessing new markets, taxes, about job creating and about working people. And if to refer to people, in this sector, I want to underline that I am coming from this sector. My career starts actually in this sector. So I must say that is one of the most, is the best experience for young people. It is the best experience for students that are in this sector. So the students can bring new opportunities, good salaries, and uh, interesting jobs. Moldovan University offers well-prepared students, and the industry has, uh, has the opportunity 
to interfere in curricula, uh, to interfere in, in programs, to um, prepare the students for, com uh, for competitive uh, workforce. And here is uh, all for us. It's about us. It's about to bring more support to this field. It's about to bring more opportunities for the companies that want to be in business services. And it's about to contribute to develop this sector in the Republic of Moldova. Dear colleagues, business services has a strong partner in the parliament and in the government. And we are open to analyze and to discuss the policies, the mechanism to support this sector and to have more contribution to this. We are aligned with you, with all your interest. I wish you all a fruitful discussion and I hope that this summit will bring us new opportunities, new support to the, uh, to the uh, sector and very important step to develop the uh, uh, domain. I want to thank all organizers that contribute to this uh, event, Swiss cooperation, German cooperation, ABL, ABSL uh, company that are the motor of uh, all these uh, things that we are doing together. And I wish that in coming months we will have some initiatives in the parliament as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Morozova. The parliament is supporting the, the offer that has come from the government. So we are very happy also to have our exponents, if I can say so, of the business sector and uh, specifically of the business services sector in the parliament to support the industry with a deep dive understanding of the needs and the potential impact of the industry. For the festive opening, I would like to invite also another strategic partner for ABSL Summit and for the business services sector industry. The Invest Moldova agency has always been a strong partner. And Mr. Ion Yordaki, the Deputy Director General, will tell us more. Bună ziua! Stimați oaspeți, distinși oaspeți, mulțumesc că ați ajuns aici în Republica Moldova, ca să nu fur foarte mult din timpul dumneavoastră prețios. Deci sunt două chestii care agenția de investiții urmează să le implementeze alături de ABSL Moldova. Prima este generarea de mai mult export și aici noi să venim cu instrumentele noastre clasice, da? Atât pentru prima dată în export mission să avem și business services ca să facem mai mare export și începem chiar cu România și vă invităm să fortificăm sau să aducem aici și alte țări și a doua este invitația noastră către voi, tot sectorul, ca directivele date la ABSL Summit în, în, în Berlin de realocarea companiilor din Asia, noi să fim toți implicați și să aducem cât mai mulți investitori. Înțeleg că este o competiție pentru voi, dar asta este și o dezvoltare a noastră. Deci tot suportul pentru ABSA Moldova în fortificarea acestor instrumente alături de noi și guvernul da, își dorește tot mai mult și mai mult ca aceste instrumente să crească și să aducă cât mai mulți bani sau mai multe skills-uri aici în țară. Vreau să vă mulțumesc în primul rând vouă pentru implicarea ABSA Moldova și tuturor partenerilor de dezvoltare că au susținut și susțină Chiar dacă asociația este una tânără, vreau să vă spun că este una din cele mai productive. Succes nouă tuturor! Easy. Thank you, Mr. Yordaki, for the supporting words and thank you for including the um, business services sector in your support portfolio on the export promotion, but also on the investment attraction and also what is very important on the country brand promotion because this is where the investment attraction export promotion starts. Dear participants, ladies and gentlemen, the summit festive opening session is over and we are moving on to the next part of our uh, ABSL summit to the 
general overview of the business services sector in Moldova. This is what we will discuss with the next uh, two speakers. What is important also uh, before, we, before we start, I would like also to mention some of the partners of the ABSL Summit, strategic partners is German Cooperation, implemented by JZ, Switzerland and Invest Moldova, golden sponsors, GPG, companies GPG, Luxali Consulting and ACA Partners, and silver sponsor, sponsors are Viatel, Ascendis and HR Consulting. So, we're moving on and for the next uh, session, I would like to invite um, two ladies, Diana Pierzu, Executive Director, ABSL Moldova, and Alina Timotin, Tax Manager with PricewaterhouseCoopers. Please welcome them, and let's find out how the business services sector looks like in Moldova. Greetings to everyone. Uh, first of all, on behalf of ABSL Moldova, I'd like to really say, say thank you for joining us today at the first ABSL Summit in Moldova. It is actually truly impressive to see so many of you here. Our esteemed Prime Minister of the Republic of Moldova, representatives of governmental institutions, our international guests, ABSL members, companies from the fields, and um, our strategic partners, thank you everyone for being near to us today. Uh, actually, before diving into the, our topic, general overview of business services sector, I would like to make a short introduction about our association, ABSL Moldova, who is actually the organizer of this event, and to note some of our remarkable uh, achievements in this short period of time of our existence. Uh, so what is ABSL Moldova? As an association, we was created in 2021. Uh, to be the voice of outsourcing industry in our country. Uh, our, uh, we decided to unite uh, companies engaging in service serv uh, uh, shared service centers, uh, business process outsourcing, informational technology outsourcing, research and development, and uh, other companies from the field, all together contributing to sector's evolution. Uh, at ABSL Moldova, we pride ourselves on our diverse membership because we have companies from different fields and expertise, starting from uh, call centers and customer support services up to companies that provide outsourcing of accounting services, legal services, marketing, recruitment agency, and even companies that are organizing events. Altogether, we uh, are dedicated to bring innovation, growth, and uh, excellence in our industry. Through the objectives of ABSL Moldova is, of course, to, present, to promote the interest of our members. We provide advocacy and ensure that their voices are heard when shaping regulation and policies uh, at the, in the Republic of Moldova. We facilitate investment opportunities and strive that business services sector, uh, sector is, an attractive, uh, is an attractive destination in our country. We are working on strengthening the cooperation be between the association members and between public authorities, actively promote business services sector uh, between youth and offer career opportunities. We increase the competitiveness of Moldova business sector and we are striving to put it on the global map and to improve public awareness of the sector and the communication with community on shaping policies that are striving to create a conductive business environment in our country. I'm proud to say that uh, ABSL Moldova is actually a part of an international organization. ABSL Worldwide, uh, actually ABSL is created and originated in Poland since 2009 and since then it extended to Albania, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Czech Republic, Austria, Germany, Switzerland, Hungary, Latvia, Romania and Moldova and it is very important for us to have such a recognition which grants us uh, an access to a vast networking network of industry leaders and uh, thank you to Pavel which is present here for your guidance and uh, is very appreciated to us, thank you very much. For our, uh, let's move to our achievements. Uh, to my point of view, for an association that has only three years uh, uh, in the country, we managed to have a lot of achievements. One of it is the accreditation of ABSL Poland to join the worldwide organization. 
We signed a memorandum of understanding with German Outsourcing Association and the West East Consulting Firm, which helps us to exchange ideas, to share best practices. And actually, it's not, not only about it, it is about transcending borders, about opening doors to international cooperation, and it is very important for us. Uh, this year in May, we achieved to become the um, members of Economic Council to the Prime Minister. Actually, it is a very serious responsibility for us uh, because we strive to create a conductive business environment in our country. And this grants us the opportunity to directly participate in shaping policies and discussion about different initiatives, which aims uh, and actually... Actually, this grants us the opportunity to directly participate in discussion regarding even to national economy of the Republic of Moldova. Uh, another of our achievements is successfully implementing GIS Moldova's local subsidy, which actually um, is a long journey of one year for us. We have certain activities during 12, uh, 12 months which we implement in order to strengthen the sector and to increase the visibility of our association. For example, we created a complex promotional campaign. We discussed with different economics to collect data in order to see uh, where we are with business services and what is the future of this sector. We organized different trainings for company members in order to, um, to make them be updated with the most uh, recent data. Uh, we have organized this event also with the support of GIS. Thank you, thank you for this opportunity. And last and not least, uh, we successfully launched two studies in the Republic of Moldova. Last year we had the first and unique study in the Republic of Moldova on business services sector. Uh, and now, the second year, we decided to make it more comprehensive, interviewing more companies and having more data about the sector, about the talent pool, and I'm happy to share that my colleague Alina uh, is doing the research on behalf of Pricewaterhouse Company, which is also a BSL member, and she will share more details about the data. One, two, okay. So first, uh, let me thank Diana because it is a pleasure to stand here together with you and uh, thanks for gathering a lot of business, public, uh, smart and beautiful people. Applause for Diana. Thank you, thank you very much. So let's, uh, let's go to the numbers, my favorite part. Um, basically, for each company all over the world, it is a challenge to survive. And it is a bigger challenge to have a successful business. Uh, this happens all over the world. And in Moldova, we also have some macroeconomic uh, situation that impacts all of us, like uh, the real growth rate of minus 2.4%. Uh, that was registered this quarter, uh, the first quarter of 2023, compared to the first quarter of 2022. Also, the inflation rate in August 2023 is 9.69%, and uh, compared to the same period last year, when it was more than 30%, I would say that it is a good inflation rate compared to previous year. And the labor participation rate is uh, 44%, for the second quarter, 2003. Coming further to the trade balance, because the export of services are part of a general overall trade balance. In Moldova, we have a negative trade balance, uh, but with the exception of services sector, because for the services sector, we have a positive one, and it impacts the, neg the negative overall trade balance by diminishing the negative impact. And now we are coming closer and closer to the sector services. So when we look at the export of services, what do we see? For the last three years, we see that uh, during 2021, compared to 2020, the export of services increased by 30%. And during 2022, compared to 2021, the export of services increased by uh, 
And overall, during the last two years, the export of services increased by 55%. And uh, this um, evolution is also registered at the level of quarters, meaning that, uh, for example, we have the most current data for the first quarter of 2023. And when we look at each quarter, first quarter of each year, we also see a positive evolution. And now we are here, the business, ser uh, business services sector in Moldova. You are smiling because it is close to your heart, I know. <laughs> so, uh, what do we have here? Uh, we have more companies. Uh, basically, plus 14% more companies. The companies increased their incomes, meaning that they developed their activities in the Republic of Moldova. Also, these companies hire more employees, plus 32% more employees. This is a great evolution, I would say. Based on our analysis of the number of companies, we made the top, top five. First place, IT services. And this is mainly due to the uh, favorable tax, tax framework, to the tax incentives because the number of uh, IT companies increased after the tax incentives were introduced. Second place, legal and accounting activities, and we have uh, local companies and also international companies, like I am from an international company, PricewaterhouseCoopers, big four company. Third place, management and business uh, consultancy. Fourth place, marketing services, and the others is, are on the fifth place. So like uh, Diana said, like Avar said, this sector is very diverse, meaning that we have a lot of services uh, that cover this sector, payroll, accounting, IT, R&D, uh, R&D meaning research and development, product design, development, telemarketing, business intelligence, debt collection, inbound, outbound sales, logistics, HR, recruiting, data entry, invoicing, and many others. I just didn't have enough place on this circle, so... <laughs> so this is uh, just the activities that uh, were included in this graphic, but there are many more. Uh, so, the next important issue are people. Based on our analysis, 80% of the costs of a company from the services sector represent the salary costs. So it is very important to pay attention to the potential workforce. During the 2022-2023 study year, we had more than 13,000 graduates, uh, 56,000 students from 21 higher educational institutions. Also, we have, I would say, some gender equality because 60% are women from the students, 40% are men. And these students uh, graduated a very diverse, uh, very different specialties. On the top is business administration and law, second place education, then engineering, architecture, construction, followed by IT and others. So, uh, as I mentioned, people are very important. So that's why uh, these companies hire more than dismiss. Uh, based on our study, payroll study, the average recruitment rate is of uh, 38% and the average dismissal rate is of 21%. Almost 70% of companies are hunting for experienced professionals. And the top future skills are technical skills, digital, digital and automation skills, and uh, yeah, foreign language is very, very important. Besides salary, it is very important to have a balanced uh, policy, remuneration policy, meaning monetary and non-monetary part. Uh, so the companies from the sector also have different uh, benefits. 
coffee refreshment, team buildings, foreign languages, flex time, entertainment, special occasion bonuses, and medical insurance. So salaries continue to increase. And this is a good, good thing. Everyone wants bigger salaries. Uh, so uh, during the last year, the salary were increased by 12%, and uh, for this year, companies plan to increase the salary by 11%. Uh, we are really waiting for the final results of our study that will be finalized in October. All the companies, 100% increased salaries, some of them twice during the year due to a high inflation rate. And the last slide, besides people, besides good salaries, besides languages, because we know a lot of languages, every one of us knows Romanian and Russian. Uh, we, yes, and we, have, we learn at school, at uh, university second languages, like English, German, French, Italian. There are regions that speak Bulgarian, Ukrainian, Turkish. We have time zone compatibility. We are close to the European market. The government is open to us. We have competitive operational costs. And the last, but not the least, because the tax area is close to my heart, I would say that we have uh, great tax incentives. And uh, currently, they are applicable for IT companies. But each year, activities are added here. And um, I hope that in the future, uh, the BPO sector will benefit of tax incentives. So, in the end, I would say, Moldova, keep amaze us, because this sector will grow here. Thank you. We say thank you to these brilliant ladies for their general overview of the business sector and also presenting us the ABSL. Thank you, um, Diana, and thank you, Alina, for giving us uh, thoughts, foot to forth thoughts, and um, land for debate while our stage is preparing. I would like to, to go through some things that I have noted which are important, I think, in this respect. While, so what we find out and what we will discuss also in the next uh, panels is that the business and services industry is the most resilient industry. On the global level, we're not talking about just Moldova, and the COVID-19 pandemic has showed that. The industry has continuous growth uh, in terms of workforce, in terms of turnover. The business service sector is the one creating the majority of job opportunities also in Moldova. You have seen the growing numbers, though the economy is uh, a little bit slowing, going down. In the first quarter, the industry is growing due to its globalization. The business services sector is leading the way in creating an inclusive environment, and we have seen that, so uh, opportunities for young people, for women, both for women, both for men, uh, uh, for, for people that uh, cannot afford to go to a job place, that, but they can work, uh, people with disabilities maybe also. The business service sector is uniquely positioned to facilitate the relocation of workforces from urban hubs to industrial regions. So people can work actually from everywhere and the Prime Minister himself has mentioned also that, that it's also important that we can bring at least virtually our diaspora to add value to the economy, but also we can bring them physically more and more and more and also bring more foreigners, more international experts. We are using this, uh, this opportunity as well. The business service sector is also the sole sector with a consistently positive trade balance. This uh, has helped Moldova to reduce the trade balance in goods in the recent years, and that is the way forward and the opportunity that we should use to have a greater impact on the trade balance and to have um, stuff balanced in this respect. So, for the next uh, part of our ABSL summit, I would like to announce uh, Igor Stefaniec from the Invest Moldova Agency, who will be the chair, will chair this, uh, this panel. Please welcome Igor. And uh, Igor will debate, will discuss with his uh, participants uh, how do we explore the future trends and business services. Igor, the floor is yours, so take the lead. 
Is it? Yeah, it's working. Hi, good morning to everybody. Excellencies, dear guests, ladies and gentlemen, it's nice to see you. Uh, nice to see you again, uh, our beautiful and nice guests from, uh, from uh, Poland, Romania, uh, and Belgium as well. Uh, I would like to start the, the first panel that will be related to the exploring the future trends in business services. That's one very important uh, for, for us also as a government because we'd like to highlight what is the niche that we would like to focus in the future in terms of unique selling propositions, what is the skills that we would like to, uh, to prepare for the future potentially investors and, and, and companies that will, uh, will uh, grow here in our country. Uh, so I'm honored to introduce our uh, distinguished guests and panels of, uh, of the speakers. Uh, each of them are uh, uh, very important for the growing uh, uh, ABSL uh, uh, sector and will bring a lot of knowledge and uh, uh, mentorship uh, for, for our uh, uh, companies. So first of all, I will go with Francesca Postolaki, who is Vice President of ABSL Romania, and also represents the Pricewaterhouse. Uh, then we'll go to... It's up to you. Then we'll go uh, to Mr. Pavel Pancic, Chief Development Officer of ABSL Poland. I'm not sure you totally correct the name. It's up to you. Uh, also, Dan Zaharia, uh, leasing consulting of Modern Office Building Extend Romania. And the last but not the least, Olivia Prado, founder and CEO of GPG Group and the president of ABSL Moldova. What a beautiful team we have. Yeah. I was thinking about the, the, the moderating, but uh, Mr. Prime Minister already have changed a little bit the, the, uh, the game because uh, already he announced that we'll have uh, some fiscal incentives that already is changing a little bit our um, uh, offer as, the, uh, as, uh, as a BPO, uh, as business services uh, sector. But I would like to discuss a little bit of uh, several points. Um, first of all, uh, I, I will highlight the, the top uh, uh, themes that I would like to, to uh, you to answer and to discuss is the positioning and location in the strategy of expansion because now we are discussing about the near shoring and why Moldova could be uh, one of the offers for the potential company that we'd like to remove or to, uh, to expand their business in our country or to remove from one uh, region to another. And what should be our offer and uh, why the, uh, the business culture and the adaptability of our workforce could be one of the main offers in, in this field. Uh, and the uh, second point that I would like to discuss in this film will, uh, is one very trendy, is uh, artificial intelligence and how it influences uh, the, uh, the skills and also the, the trends in the, in the BPO. Uh, but we'll start uh, step by step and the, the last one will be the most difficult one, the skill and the workforce, the talent pool and uh, how we should adjust uh, to this one of the biggest problems. Uh, we have seen that we have, a, uh, and this is one of the most adaptable uh, economic sector uh, in, uh, from our point of view. But at the same time, uh, they had the biggest pressure on, uh, on the workforce um, because it needs different skills and uh, qualified people. So that's why let's start first with uh, positioning and location and uh, to discuss a bit uh, of the role or of nearshoring of Republic of Moldova. And I will start with the, the lady uh, with Madame Postolaki. Uh, uh, why Moldova is a nearshoring destination for us and what should be in the future our uh, unique selling proposition in, in the terms of business services? Uh, first of all, thank you and I'm very happy to be here and thank you for the question. Um, why Moldova is important? I think Moldova is important, first of all, because it is located in Europe. Uh, it is a small country, but in the same time offers a lot of opportunities. If you think about people and skills and resources that we can find in Moldova. Uh, location is critical because um, 
if we think from a time zone perspective, uh, people from Moldova can work equally for different countries in Europe and can work also for countries in uh, US, for example, without being necessary to work in night shifts. If you take those 24 hours a day, you'll always find uh, overlap, I mean, or some hours where people from Moldova can work for different countries in the world. And of course, the flexibility and the learning ability of Moldovans is highly appreciated. Thank you very much. <laughs> Mr. Pavel, I would like to ask you because uh, Moldova, Romania, Poland, all of us, we are using in our uh, presentation that we are between East and West and we, our positioning offers uh, uh, perfect uh, uh, answer to both uh, medians or the, or the economic poles on the East and West and we also are adaptable, we can speak several languages. So what is the difference between Poland and Moldova? And I know that uh, the uh, ABSL Poland is uh, several years ahead. And what should the lessons in terms of uh, uh, location and, and uh, uh, strategic communication in this field? Thank you, Francesca, for mentioning all the most important elements when choosing a location. Um, they are very um, country-oriented, and we should not forget about one element. And it's, it's a truism. COVID has changed everything. So when you're asking me what's the difference between Poland and uh, Moldova, there is no difference because we are not looking in this sector at a location. We are looking at global talent sourcing. So today, if you listen to the arguments of Philippines, uh, India or Costa Rica, they all mentioned who they have. They don't look at where they are. It is important because French shoring, not even near term, but French shoring is becoming a trend. So we are looking at the ease and predictability of doing business. And Moldova is offering that, uh, both of those elements. But to tell the truth, COVID has put Moldova on the global map of global business services with the availability of talent. And the talent and the quality of talent, I wouldn't even say the amount of talent because uh, People are looking at specific skills, or companies are looking at specific skills. If they find those skills in certain number, they employ that number. If they need more, they will look somewhere else. But this is the biggest and most important element. Global talent sourcing offers Moldova equal rights and opportunities to be on the business services map of the whole world. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> I would like to ask also Mr. Zaharia because he is coming from Yash, who is not far from, from Kishinev, and also a very important uh, already city in terms of business services, who have grown uh, faster than Kishinev, I will be honest, in, in the last years. And what is the secret behind this uh, success, Mr. Zaharia? The secret is Moldova. As, uh, as long as Moldova is stable, uh, Yash is growing. Uh, because we are not looking to relocate businesses from Moldova to Romania, but uh, uh, businesses from uh, Moldova that have grown up to a point uh, uh, can very easily uh, be three hours drive, uh, opening a new center in uh, Romania without affecting the, the activity in Moldova. What uh, I'm looking at near shoring, and uh, it's excellent that you you mentioned French shoring because no one wants to have uh, rockets on a near shoring uh, uh, call center. Um, is uh, the fact that uh, Moldova has a, also a hidden uh, is a hidden gem um, because uh, you have a lot of talents, a lot, of, a lot of young people all over Europe, and they can work remotely. Uh, or they can uh, take into consideration coming back home because they do have now um, uh, work offers that uh, is uh, comparable to uh, maybe European uh, levels when you consider also the living cost here. So uh, nearshoring actually um, helps relocalizing the workforce, the young workforce, back home. And uh, this is a mission that Moldova takes it very seriously. 
we saw it uh, participating almost every year in uh, the uh, summits in Poland, which, yes, have half of the uh, business of uh, outsourcing in uh, the Central and Eastern Europe. Um, and it's part of the big family of Central and Eastern Europe countries, stable ones, uh, uh, that do attract as a region. Okay? It's important for Moldova to, to be on the uh, short list. And uh, for sure, at some point, some company uh, will come here uh, and develop and, of course, will look into the experience of the existing companies. And I think Moldova uh, is a success story already for uh, outsourcing. Yeah, thank you very much. That's true. That's why we, as an agency, we are still uh, trying to do, to do leads to promote our country uh, on all the economic sector, especially in the last years on, on business services and to, to attract new newcomers. But we have here Olivier, who has more than 20 years of experience in the Republic of Moldova. How do you feel uh, after 20 years of experience in here and how you also promote as a president of ABSL uh, the potential uh, the opportunities in the business services sector? Thank you for all for being here. And uh, uh, I'm the only one from Moldova, although I'm adopted. Uh, but in, indeed, I was there from the beginning, and I saw the evolution in in the in the sector. And what is really something which amazed me is that uh, although we are now uh, fighting to have more members in a BSL, the sector is much larger than everybody everybody thinks. There are much, many more companies which are not, for some reasons, willing to show up, but sometimes very big ones, especially working, uh, call center working for the United States. We have uh, many people from the diaspora, as the um, Prime Minister was uh, mentioning, working in the logistic uh, field, Co company that sometimes guys that were went to the United States uh, to build companies uh, in the um, uh, truck companies and then uh, exp now importing or exporting, whatever you see it, uh, companies in Moldova to handle their back office. There are many, extremely many. Uh, there are companies working in tourism for the United States. I mean, the number of companies that we have is indeed more impressive than we think. This is the first remark. The second remark is that uh, when we announced yesterday uh, the, the, the new draft of the IT law, I've seen a few remarks on, uh, on Facebook, which will, uh, as an uh, association, we will address and we will write a position paper. But I, I was amazed to see that some, some people still have this vision of I would say romantic vision of what a call center is. You know, they think that we have people doing stupid things, uh, but it's absolutely not the case. When we say call center, usually we use this word because it's well understood, but the, the reality between, be, behind this, uh, this uh, word is absolutely immense. We, we, we have people doing extremely complicated things, uh, extremely developed things. We have high-skilled people, uh, of course not IT guys, but definitely uh, something really uh, developed. And we are, I'm sure, and we will speak about when we will discuss about AI, we are, uh, or say, the, the, the value added of those people is, is really high, getting higher now. I, I'm sure you will agree with me, uh, um, uh, Pavel. So this romantic vision of a call center is totally up, updated. Uh, this is the second remarks. Uh, third one concerning the, 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 the future, I think uh, we have some challenges. We cannot, we cannot uh, not mention them. And I think it's what you, coming back to what you were saying, it's about people. And I think all the countries around us have the same issues, uh, especially in Eastern Europe for some demographic reasons, some reasons of proximity with, uh, with Europe when many people are going to Europe sometimes 
in my perspective, it's, it's a mistake, but that's another question. Uh, and we, we, are facing, uh, we, we are facing, we are not yet in Moldova at the point, I think, where we can truly believe that people will come back. But we are on the way. We are on the way. And sometimes I am amazed to see the, 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 the level of the, the, the salaries that we are offering, which are getting very sometimes very close from what they, they can get in Europe. Yeah, es especially that there is one thing that uh, people do not understand in, in Moldova and abroad, is that because of the shortage, uh, in my company, the, the, the age is very low. I mean, you can be 30, 25, 28, and have large... Uh, responsibilities, and we have seen that in all the association, in all the companies, we have young people, very young people, uh, getting well, high responsibilities. Whether in Europe, usually, and I can speak about it, if you want to accede to higher responsibilities, you have to be a bit old like me, uh, because you have to, to go through the steps. And uh, and this is something that is really amazing and and a truly truly opportunity for the young people. And I'm not sure they understand that. Olivier, I have one proposal. Uh, the perception issue of the sector is very important. So let's say we should not be using the call center, let's use the customer support center. Whoever uses call center pays a fine of 100 lei and will be collecting these fines at the exit of the conference. Um, we are already in, uh, in Romania not using IT and outsourcing, we are switching to tech industry because tech also has the micro production of electronics and uh, it's a mix and uh, uh, does appeal uh, as being more sexy to, to the young generation. Not IT, not outsourcing, but tech. Yeah, the, the, uh, the idea that we today discuss a little bit about workforce uh, before coming to, to, the, to the venue and uh, a little bit of statistics. Ten years ago, we discussed with Francesca that in Republic of Moldova we have almost half a million of youngsters between 19 and 24 years. We understand that demographically today, we will be honest, a little bit uh, tougher and it's less than uh, 300,000 uh, uh, youngsters between 19 and 24 years. Uh, of course, 72% of them are studying in English language uh, as a second language, 20% of them in French language, but in the same time, there is a big pressure on the, uh, on the workforce and a big competition in each economic field. Uh, but uh, the idea that the business services sector is uh, one of the sectors that is uh, very important for us in terms of exports. It generates high-value exports, uh, it adjusts uh, uh, very easy the, the workforce from one sector to another, and in the same time, uh, the BPO is the, the business services sector is the one that uh, can be applied the new technologies, automation and AI. And I would like to ask you, uh, 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 where do you feel is the fields where it will be applied, and how it could adjust the uh, the pressure on workforce using the artificial intelligence? And to we'll start with uh, uh, Francesca. Uh, it's a difficult question. I would love to know the answer. But uh, considering how quickly things are changing, I think it's difficult to assess exactly what would be the, uh, let's say, the industry or sub-industry. What I think it's important to mention is that due to different challenges that Moldova used to have in the past, it helped our people uh, and they um, have grown up in, uh, with a very, very ambition and motivation that probably other countries don't have this. And if you take, I'm also from Moldova, and I'm proud of being Moldovan, but if you take a young uh, student from Moldova, and you may take a young student from another country in Europe, you will see that Moldovans are really dedicated. So answering your question, I think, depending on opportunities. Of course, AI will change and is changing a lot and everybody is talking these days about AI. And uh, I think a lot of people from uh, those presented in this room, they have started to use ChatGPT or to look, to look at what AI is offering. Uh, indeed, it saves, saves a lot of time, but in the same time creates a number of new opportunities. It is a continuous development and the uh, speed these changes, uh, these changes now, it's absolutely fantastic. I mean, you, you can't, you just have to be there and have to be present and you will be on the flow. Yeah, 
Thank you. I know that uh, I know that a lot of uh, procedures and a lot of actions uh, in the in the field of uh, of business service definitely will be uh, influenced by by AI. Already, I know a lot of companies that are here in strategic communication, in marketing are using a lot. So uh, that's uh, a question for Pavel. If uh, you have more than four hundred uh, thousand. Uh, people involved in the business services in Poland. Uh, what, uh, what is the, few, how AI will influence? It will uh, erase some, uh, some uh, activities, it will erase some specific skills, and what, uh, what do you think will be the influence of AI? Sure. It's a similar story to a couple of years ago when uh, automation and robotics started being introduced in the companies. And then people were afraid that it's going to take our jobs. Yes, it will take your job if you're not developing and growing. Because where does automation, robotics, and AI step in? In the easiest, w now, nowadays, in the easiest way. So, yes, I'm ready to do whatever I declared, but uh, automation, robotics, and AI will step into what we now, unfortunately, call um, the call centers, 100 lay. And if we are going to change the perception, we should not be afraid of doing it and involving it. So, for example, AI is more complex version of automation and robotics that has already removed the call center jobs 200 lay somewhere else. And what it's going to do to us is going to make the job a little easier if we are thinking about growth and development, not only of the company, but also ourselves. So, for example, AI will become as popular as Booking.com or TripAdvisor is, both business-wise and individual people. Business-wise, it will send all the repeatable job to the engine of AI that we are, being, uh, we are going to involve. And personally, we will start using AI that will make it easier for us to understand it's helping, not disturbing. When, for example, here yesterday I was in Krikova, and to understand which wines are for which food, I was asking the questions to ChatGPT and to Bard. Unfortunately, Bard was faster and better to answer what should I take if I'm taking this or that type of food. But this shows that it's an enabler. And for the young generation that is paying a lot of attention to work-life balance, AI will help to do repeatable things faster so they have more time for themselves, both business-wise and individually. Yeah. Thank you very much. This is the, the general idea, to focus on value-aided and to reduce the, the, the uh, job-intensive uh, uh, work that is uh, related to the, to, to the job. Uh, I would like also to to ask uh, Mr. Dan Zaharia regarding the, the to be regarding the focus on evaluated uh, business services in each and what will uh, be the future trends in your opinion in in the field of uh, business services what niche you think we should uh, adjust our uh, focus on the investment attraction on promotion and also the curricula in the university should be adjusted to which uh, niche in this sector uh, yes, Igor, thank you. Uh, so, um, uh, coming back just a little bit to demographics, I think uh, we should uh, look into other uh, demographic segments, like 30 plus, like 40 plus. Uh, we at the informal school of IT, our average uh, age at which people are looking for reconversion to IT or to business services is 30 plus. Uh, also, uh, AI is just another tool, smarter, uh, that will make us smarter. And uh, uh, excellent point with the uh, work balance, uh, uh, work uh, uh, life balance. Um, um, I think Moldova uh, should uh, be posi positioned as a safe country, as a country with uh, lots of talent, with uh, multiple uh, language uh, skills, I think French and German are much more developed uh, as a density than, uh, than uh, in Romania. 
And uh, I, will, I will look into uh, not only uh, putting programs in the master level or in the bachelor level, but also at the gymnasium and uh, high school, like uh, advanced Excel, okay? Like uh, not only English, I, I call English as uh, being like a hygiene factor. It lets you uh, stay at the uh, table, but will not feed you. Everyone knows English. Uh, uh, in Romania and uh, uh, also in, uh, in Moldova. I've, I'm looking at the active population. Maybe not in parts of Germany, maybe not in parts of France. Um, um, so uh, language skills, uh, also Excel and uh, working with business programs should be implemented at the younger ages. And younger generations should understand that this is a career. Uh, they can develop here. It's no uh, need to, for them to, to go outside, uh, maybe just for, uh, to have some studies, but nothing else. Uh, and uh, what Olivier said at some point, being from another country, uh, you can have like a glass ceiling uh, in a uh, hierarchy in a, uh, in a company that uh, is outside your uh, country of origin. Maybe you don't see it, no matter the gender. It's, uh, you are not a German, you can not uh, maybe uh, 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 be on a higher uh, hierarchy in Germany. But you can be in a German company here in, in, uh, in Moldova. That's true, we are promoting the country as, uh, as a talented one. And by the way, the statistic shows that we have 14 languages in business services in Moldova. I was amazed to know that we have companies that speak in, that speak in Swedish, in Czech, for Czech Republic also, they, they develop in Czech language. So that's the adaptability of our country. It's, uh, I think, one of the most important uh, key selling proposition because uh, we are sp speaking fluently Romanian language, that is Latin language, Russian, English, so we're from three family uh, of languages. So the adaptability of, uh, also as Francesca uh, have mentioned, that uh, during our history, we always uh, sh uh, must adapt to something new. So I think this is the, the most important, and as I mentioned, that the BPO is the most adaptable economic sector. And that's why we are very focused on, on it in order to, to be the next, uh, let's say, star in terms of uh, uh, generating the revenue for our economy and budget. And uh, Mr. Olivier, that's a huge pressure on you and, um, and on us as well to, to develop this sector. I would like to, to, to ask you what are the skills necessary for the future workforce, in your opinion? Okay, thank you. Uh, I would like to come back to uh, what, what Pavel said. He, he said it from a macro point of view, and I fully agree with him. Uh, I would like to give you my, my, my view on the micro, uh, because I also have a company, which is a medium-sized company, I would say, and uh, we have already started to use uh, AI, uh, and I, I have a couple of remarks to do. Uh, the first one is that, um, of course, like a, a bit like everybody, when, I, when we started to speak about AI, I was a bit afraid, uh, and I will tell you why. Because as a very big company, usually you have a department, uh, IT department, you have even sometimes dedicated IAI department, which uh, allows you to, uh, to catch up with the, the technology and, and use it properly. When you are a small company or a medium-sized company, like we have many in Moldova, how do you, how, how do you handle this AI? Because sometimes you don't have uh, a big AI, uh, IT department, you don't have, you don't have the, the money to to create a, an AI department. So how do, how, do you, how do you do this when you are a small and medium company? It's a question that I'm sure will be one of the central questions very soon, including in Moldova. How do you do that as a, as a businessman? Uh, we have seen in practically how we, we did it. And uh, the impression I have is that AI will be used mostly through smart agents. That means that AI will be complementary to the task, working complementary to the task that an agent is doing. So the agent will not disappear. His job will not be the same. And I can give you a very practical example. We, we have already, uh, instead of 
having an agent going in the database, finding the ans answer, uh, looking around, the, the, the AI is giving him the answer. By the way, in the language you want. You understand that it's very, very interesting. When we work, for instance, for booking or Airbnb, and we have a client uh, uh, writing any languages, the answer will come in this language. So uh, you can also already understand the changes that will, uh, that will appear very soon and, and, and the benefit that Moldova, and not only Moldova, will get out of this. And then, but you still need the agent because you cannot just send uh, the answer from AI without checking it. So you need to check it. So what I mean without going into many details is that the jobs will not disappear as we can read sometimes and heard some people saying, my opinion, stupid things. But the, the, the task definitely will change and they are already changing. Thank you very much, Olivia. <laughs> I um, uh, would like to, uh, to come to the last question to everybody of you. That is the, the main uh, uh, proposition of the, uh, our panel, which is the future trends. Uh, we understand that soon we'll have a dedicated fiscal incentive for our country. We have a pool of uh, potential workforce that we would like to attract here. Also, we have specific companies uh, that are uh, uh, leading companies in the world that we'd like to also to, to invite them to, to, uh, to be part of, uh, of the sector here. Uh, and uh, in these terms, I would like to, to ask uh, Mr. Pav, what is the forecast uh, in, in your opinion of the uh, Moldova uh, business service sector and what is the future trends in your opinion? Um, I can provide the answer based on the findings of the recent uh, ABSL Poland report that predicts the growth of the sector. The growth was 8% in the last year. The growth in the next year is going to be between 6 and 7%. Uh, probably that could be applicable to other locations in smaller numbers, but still there will be growth and we saw that from um, the report prepared by PwC. And the second information is if we need to promote anything, we need data. No one questions data, especially when it's stamped with PwC stamp. So if you want to do anything outside of Moldova, have the data verified by anyone that is unquestionable. And PwC as a partner for that is a great one. Go wherever you can, provide the data, ask the questions, what the, need, the business need of the people that you're talking to, and try to extrapolate the information from the report that will answer that need. Because then, anyone that is providing the information that are needed is a partner. And it's so much easier to work with the partners that have data. Thank you very much for the input, yeah. That's very important. That already generates an idea to, to organize a dedicated and targeted uh, lead generation uh, campaign on the business service sector, together with, uh, why not, with Pricewaterhouse. Uh, Francesca, also the same, uh, the same question. You represent not only the ABS of Romania, but also Pricewaterhouse Romania. That's also a company that in share service center. And uh, in, in your opinion, what is the future trends in the business service sector? Um, I think the future trends can be, okay, everybody is talking that the basic um, labor-intensive tasks will be replaced by AI and by automated, automated tasks. But in the, context, in the context of the country of Moldova, I think the trends should be analyzed also with the overall situation. And considering the lack of resources across the globe, I think Moldova is in a position where it has to be selective about the next services that Moldovans can provide. Considering the population of Moldova and the size, it is a small country, so it will be difficult to develop here a huge number of companies with huge number of employees. However, we can easily develop smaller teams, very knowledgeable, and w that will be, will, will be able to provide value-added services to global companies. 
again, considering the historic of history of Moldova and the ability of this population to be to adapt and to be flexible, it's a, a big advantage for the country. Just thinking about the, what I've heard today in the morning from the Prime Minister, three words I've remembered, exports, which indeed Moldova, it's a country that can easily export uh, value-added services, support from the government. It's, um, you'll not see many countries in the world where the Prime Minister will come to the event and will confirm that the government is supporting the industry. And the third word was diaspora. So the ability to try to involve as many Moldovans and employ as many Moldovans as possible, I think it's, again, a big advantage. Um, and considering the future trends, yeah, probably as the world continues to develop more and more value-added services will be available, I think, from Moldova. One more observation from my side is, um, the fact we have done an analysis, and I'll share briefly with you, we have done an analysis in Romania because we wanted to see how much this industry, and I'm talking about business services industry, contributes to the GDP. You'll be amazed to hear the proportion, and um, unfortunately, there are no available data, and probably in Moldova the same, because you'll have a number of industry when you look at the analysis and you'll see the trade industry is contributing so much, the uh, finance industry, banks and finance is contributing of so much, financial services industry. However, the business service industry as an industry separately, it's difficult to collect the data. So I would recommend to Moldova to think about a tool that will allow to collect the data and to see exactly how much is the contribution of this young industry to the GDP. You'll be amazed of the results, I guess. Such tool exists, but it comes from the competition, so I will not mention it. But there are ways and we can help because we've been doing it. In Poland, it's 4.8 GDP. No one can skip that, 4.8. Probably in Moldova, it may be even more because of the size of the economy. Go for it. In Romania, it's the fourth largest industry that contributes to the GDP. We also believe that we will exceed a lot of uh, traditional industries, especially from agri-food, because nowadays the IT industry is 4% of only IT. ICT is already 7. IT is 4% of GDP, and the export of services from IT that also is business services, uh, it's uh, exceeding such economic sector as exports of wine that Everybody knows how beautiful wines. So yeah, that's uh, that's a um, uh, interesting uh, point, and definitely we would like to 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 calculate and to understand what is the uh, export of services. It's our future goal for the next year uh, in our key figures that should uh, should be adjusted. Also, Mr. Zachary, I would like uh, to ask you, because you uh, communicate with a lot of companies during your experience in the field of business services, and from your opinion and your experience, what is the, the future trends in, in our region in the field of business services? I think the region in itself should become a magnet for talent force. So you should look into the quota of your immigration uh, dedicated to digital workers, not only construction, not only uh, uh, Glovo and whatever we have in uh, Romania. Now in Romania, all the Glovo, Glovo uh, workers are dark colored, uh, which is like a, a change in the last three months. Uh, no Romanian is uh, uh, delivering food anymore. Uh, what if Romania and Moldova at some point would, would set a quota for digital workers from uh, South Korea, from Israel, from uh, Indonesia, from uh, India, uh, to come here to adapt and to become uh, a part of the workforce. Also, as I mentioned before, going uh, in another uh, age uh, segments, also to, to become part of the um, workforce. I give you the example of Yash. Yash is disconnected from any highway. Uh, we uh, make more than nine hours to only exit uh, Romania, which means that the driver should 
uh, sleep and uh, make uh, 24 hours uh, just to exit Romania together with the, the, the break. Um, a half a million, almost half a million uh, city together with the metropolitan area has a workforce of 30,000 workers in IT and outsourcing. We, know, we do not have, uh, we have less than 10,000 working in industrial. And uh, this uh, trend um, was to be obtained in 2030, according to, to a study from 2015. So by 2030, for sure, we'll have one in 10 people uh, living in Iași working in this industry. Uh, it was like a, a, something unplanned, which is sometimes better. If the state plans too much, uh, things tend not to, to, uh, to uh, be uh, real. Um, as a trend, I see digitalization of the public services, uh, cyber, and um, for the outsourcing industry to look also to own some products, not only to deliver uh, services, but to own and develop products. Why? Because they have high talents uh, that can be put like in a research and development um, area and to develop better products that now are only adding value to. Um, considering the, the companies that you should look into it, look into companies that are already here, industrial one, for example, and look what at the corporate level, global corporate level, what kind of companies and services they are already using it and try to target that, the, uh, those companies to, to be in, uh, in uh, to come in Moldova as a hub, not only uh, to provide global center for, from whatever. Um, we see this with a company that is already present, uh, was present in Moldova, is present in Moldova and uh, in Romania too, an American one that bought with 20 million euro a software company from Yash. And they are using the software now globally uh, in all of their uh, almost 200 factories. So you can get new companies not only at the fairs, not only at the summits, but also look into it, make focus, very focused uh, groups with uh, uh, foreign investors that are already uh, in love with your country and see what outsourcing companies are they using now. Yeah, thank you very much, by the way. Yeah, well, that's a good point of aftercase ten, ten, strategy. 10% ten commission, yeah, 10% commission, yeah, commission okay. for the, okay. the next... Uh, and by the way, we and Yash are on the same page. We don't have highway. And, but these also have developed the uh, business service sector because uh, to export uh, uh, is one click or one call. But for production, there is need in highway and infrastructure. So from this point of view, I think it's twin cities, Yash and Kishino, that they are more focused on the, we should be more focused on the, uh, IT and business service. And so by the way, Two weeks ago, uh, an investor from uh, from UK, uh, he has several businesses, especially also in in, in uh, Asia, in Malaysia, and he told us that, you know, uh, he, it was the first time when he arrived in Moldova, and he thought Moldova is creative and is related to services. You must not produce as uh, as much as you, you are hunting the, the investors in production, but you must hunt the investors in the serving provider sector and IT because this is the, the, the future of model. That's from his perspective. Thank you very much, Mr. Zakharia. And uh, Olivier, yeah. to conclude the, 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 the panel from Moldova yeah. uh, point of view, what is the trends in your opinion in the business services? Uh, uh, okay, thank you. Uh, I would like to say something. Uh, following um, Dan's uh, uh, questions. Uh, you know, as a BSL, uh, we decided to focus on the fiscal facilities. I explained why. Strong competition worldwide, and we need uh, some support. I think this is most, mostly achieved. I mean, we, you heard the Prime Minister, this is something that uh, is almost done. Uh, what are the next the next points that we that we will need to think as a BSL. My opinion, but it's only my opinion, of course, we will discuss it together, but it's going to be the visa question. Uh, 
I don't know if the, the work permits. Not ab only absolutely, the yeah. absolutely. Because we, we, I don't know, probably like me, you go sometimes to Romania, uh, and, and I, I was amazed. I went in the center of uh, Bucharest, Caracuber. Uh, it's a very historical place, and I was I was amazed that I see I saw 90% uh, of people from Bangladesh, from the Philippines, uh, serving. So you could speak English with them. You didn't, didn't even uh, need to speak Romanian. Uh, and, and it's repeating itself. We go in any mall and you go to the, the, I mean, you see many, many people from, so the, the, Romania, which is, by the way, inside the European Union, already understood uh, the need of having this uh, uh, permits, working permit uh, policy. I think we will have this question arising in Moldova. I know it's a little bit touchy from a polit political point of view, but my opinion, we will have at one moment to discuss it, to address it to the, to the politics and to see what is the answer. I'm in favor. I would like to speak it first in a BSL and then with the, uh, with the politician and see what is their answer. The other uh, point uh, that we can also see is to outsource ourselves. This is what I'm doing. I've opened a company uh, already in Africa somewhere, and I will probably open another one, uh, because uh, already Moldova is becoming expensive, which is a good thing, and it's normal, because we have high talented multilingual people, and I have my top management here, handling people abroad, training them, following them, managing them, why not? We can do that. But we, we need to face and to address the lack of people in Moldova. And these already are two ways to do it. So this is, um, I mean, it's not really a trend in the business sector, but it's a trend that we need to uh, think about uh, in, in, uh, in Moldova and BSL Moldova. I, I, I'm sure we will, we will speak about this. Now, generally speaking, uh, I have one remark and I would not go further because uh, my, my colleagues already uh, uh, point out uh, many things. Uh, what I've seen arising the last two, three, four years is the need of multilingual support, tech support, customer support, whatever support it is. Because, because if you have products, as you, as you mentioned, if you, have, uh, if you are developing things, you need a support, always. Okay, of course, AI automatization will, will help, as I mentioned before, but it will not replace, as I mentioned also. So we, 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 need, uh, we need to have in mind that the European market is a lot of languages, and uh, I receive uh, a lot of requests with uh, Spanish, French, English, German, uh, Polish, Lithuanian, Dutch, uh, Etc. And 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 this is something that we we see more and more. And 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 again, one way to uh, to, to answer. I mean, it's very complicated to find, uh, for instance, Dutch people in uh, in uh, in Moldova. I don't I don't see Eugenia. She can help us a little bit, or or you, Lilia, uh, with with the Dutch. But it's very extremely complicated. But again, we can outsource. We have. The nomad, as uh, the Prime Minister mentioned, people abroad. We are also doing this. I have personally a, a girl that worked for me for 10 years now uh, in Spain, and she still works for us. I mean, there are many ways to, to handle this, but this is a, a strong, strong trend that I've seen uh, in the business sector, and I'm sure my colleagues will agree with me. Uh, I, will, I will stop there because I will, um, I'm a bit long otherwise. And I will answer. I'm not promising, but I know that the, the government is working on the strategy regarding the workforce and the resident permits. I know that the, the Europe been citizens it started and soon also will be the North American, South American step, but it's already a start. Second, also there will be uh, definitely some changes in the legislation and facilitation with digital nomads that will uh, also help to attract workforce in the field of uh, business services. Anybody uh, want to, uh, to add something more or to conclude? Probably one <clears throat> last comment from my side. Currently, Moldova uh, lives at period, 
I would say a little bit challenging from a number of perspectives due to geographical, political, location, and so on. Um, so this is from one side. From the other side, when you leave challenging times, it's actually good and it is an opportunity because you'll take some decisions that probably you'll not take in the less challenging times and the speed of taking decisions, it's much faster than when you live relaxed, I'll put it like this. So we should look from the opportunity perspective, not from the non-opportunity perspective. Yeah, that's true. That Can I add something? I, yeah. I fully agree with you. And I would say even more that uh, I've been in business for 20 years. And what I have seen is that recession times are very good for all sorts of things. <laughs> and we are facing now uh, a strong recession in front of us. As you saw, the, the, the figures in Germany are very, very bad. And uh, so most probably we will face a recession. But somehow, this is good news for the business sector. Olivier very nicely said uh, the famous sentence, when there's blood on the streets, let's go do business. But maybe we should also, or could also treat this session as a lesson for us, because we have been answering the questions of, of where we see the threats and where we see the opportunities. Maybe the audience, when you listen to us and, and you see how easy some things are for us or how difficult, is there anything for you being in the business or working with the, for the business. Is there anything that we didn't mention, a geopolitical situation, anything that we should keep at the back of our heads when we think about the growth of the sector? Just, you know, speak it out, spit it out, say it to us, we don't have to develop it now, but maybe we can develop it in a year time and see how it changed. Education. It's very much talent related and uh, it's a raising topic. Anything we mentioned perception, we are working on it and we are struggling with it. But anything that we should keep in mind? If not, then yes. You speak theoretically, presenting the um, current or future um, medium in Moldova for doing business in the service sector. What about the putting this in practice, um, the administrative burden, the technical um, aspects of uh, a, for a person, a company, for a company starting doing business here? What are the practical challenges. Sure. Thank you very much for bringing it up. And I think we have a very good benchmark. This meeting has started with a declaration of the Prime Minister of the changes, the tax changes. Let's meet in one year and let's see how much of what he promised has changed. And then we will be able to compare the situation from today to in a year time and then hopefully we will have him, if it's the same Prime Minister or the next one, to talk to and see if these are just words or if this is a reality. Thank you for bringing up the practice. Just to the practice question, I think if we look a little bit back and we see how the digital park has developed, over the years, it's a proof that Moldovans can quickly do things and develop. One last uh, um, idea is um, uh, Moldova should be, dream big uh, in the sense that, of course, uh, you are thinking of yourself, it's a small country, but it's an ag agile country. Um, in Romania, the prime minister would not uh, stay for lunch, he would stay only five minutes and afterwards other uh, matter would pressure him, uh, which means the sector is important. But Moldova should dream big. Imagine in Moldova in 10 years as being a key uh, player in agri-tech uh, because your agriculture is a, a legacy that you have. You have good food, good wine, uh, a lot of uh, uh, specialized cultures. How about being a top 
player in the tech, in agri-tech, uh, especially consider two factors. Uh, the climate change, okay, how do we bring food to the desert or to, to, to uh, areas with uh, lack of water, and of course, uh, uh, good food, uh, bio and whatever. Uh, this should be like a, like a dream big, okay? Because if you are just liking to, uh, to make copycat for another uh, um, smaller uh, country's uh, success stories, it's just a copycat. Um, dare to dream, dream big and uh, make your own uh, way. Yeah, thank you very much. So to conclude, the, uh, I would like to, to thank all of you for your inputs and for your experience shared uh, today as uh, uh, at this panel. And uh, that's true. Uh, we definitely will uh, start uh, to, to think about a new strategy uh, for the business services, despite 70% of uh, companies that are coming to Republic of Moldova Pre are from business services because it's very easy to relocate even now when we have uh, war at our uh, uh, neighbors. So it's very easy. You are hiring people. You have a computer, and that's uh, and that's all. But the most important that uh, definitely we need to reduce the labor intensive and to start to focus on value-added uh, uh, using a targeted approach. So thank you very much for, for your idea and inputs, and I will give the floor to Andre. Thank you. Thank you, thank you but, but I would still keep you in this, on the stage. Thank you. I would still keep you on the stage, and while you are preparing the photo for you, but please, I have a question for you. So I will let you to take the photo, and then I will have your attention. If you can be seated back, please. I have a question. A short one, no, but I would like every one of you to, to answer shortly or, or longer, if you prefer. If I debate with an opposition partner from another sector saying that the business services sector will not have something to say in a few years because of machine learning, because of AI, why should we develop it? Why should we offer tax incentives to it? What would be your answer now? The easiest, the easiest one is look at the data. Everyone else is falling down. This is the business that creates jobs and that grows. You don't want to do that? Then you didn't do your homework. Thank you. Obviously, yes. Uh, we are the sector which the, we, we might employ young people. You know, it's very funny because when we speak about IT, um, which is a splendid example of what happened, uh, 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 nevertheless, you are blocked with the number of people that are coming out from the universities. And when I, when I say whom in the sector we can employ, we can employ anyone, anyone. You know, and, and I've, I've been in, in Moldova for, for 20 years, as I mentioned before, and I can tell you one thing. I have never, never seen one diploma of uh, Moldova. I, I've, I have not seen it. And believe me, and I've, see, I've seen hundreds of people. Why? Because I don't care. If you speak French, if you speak English, if you are good at this, or you're good at... It's okay with me. So anyone, even with lower talent can be employed. And this is really important for the countries. Because, you know, I, I've seen so many young people sometimes coming out from ASEM, from university, and you know where they go? They go to England, and you know what to do. Or young ladies going to Italy, and you know what they do. Don't you think it's better to give them a good job here? Yes, I think so. Francesca, what would be your answer? Um. I think the business services is a must, especially in Moldova, uh, because, because of this employment and possibilities, I think it's not working, no, it's working. Uh, because of the possibilities that the industry offers and the ability to employ 
different people with different skills of different age, of different experience, and just think about, I don't know, people that are older than 50 years or an accountant that is 60 years old and speaks a language, that person can be easily employed by a business services company and can easily provide services to another company around the globe being located in Moldova, having a job, having a community to communicate it with, reducing the pressure on the pension system going forward and contributing or continuing to contribute even after the retirement age. Uh, two, two, two mentions. One is uh, we see in Romania young people as being ambassador of their uh, home cities. Uh, I actually had a, a talk yesterday with a young lady. Uh, she stays with her uh, Romanian husband also in Malta and is employed in a company and the company told them, okay, look into the globe and tell me where should I open a new tech hub. And of course the first thing on their mind is Yash. Um, and they would, lo would love to see what are the checklists, what are the incentives, what are the cost of the labor and everything else. So uh, my point is that uh, in, uh, you'll see more and more in the next years if you adopt such a, a friendly and uh, a clear uh, legislation, the fact that um, cities from the Republic of Moldova are being put on the checklist of uh, 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 several companies because they have employed employers from Moldova, which wants to get home or wants to a ticket home. And the second one uh, maybe is not too much for, for us. We, we, we have become a little bit arrogant, but look in the Romania that is uh, drawing back from these incentives, okay? Uh, we don't know that the legislation, with us legislation is uh, changed <laughs> from day to day. But we are looking into 2024 on which the incentive for IT force uh, with salaries above 2,000 euro uh, net uh, will not uh, have the uh, tax, uh, the fiscal tax uh, incentives of, uh, of, uh, uh, on their wage. Okay? This is an opportunity for uh, Moldova because you are you are um, needing, you need to attract. Maybe we, with 7% of the GDP already coming from the service and IT industry, we have, we have become a little bit too arrogant. But this is an opportunity for you to check this box, which Romania does check, but uh, on, on, uh, only on, until 2,000 euro. Which is, I think, 2,000 euro in Romania, it's a pretty good uh, uh, wage when you compare with the cost of living. Thank you. If you wish. I think uh, this will be the most important, it's my personal opinion, I discuss on behalf of Invest Moldova Agency. It will be the most important economic sector of our country in the future, with the biggest growth, with the biggest uh, volume of exports and revenue to the budget. Second, uh, it can employ people from 16 to infinite. So I know the cases in some villages in our country that uh, they employ all old people for data entry. So it's possible to generate and to have even 1,000 another uh, employees that could be involved in the in, in, and to generate exports. And the salaries here can be from 500 euros to 5,000. So it's a big opportunity to everyone to stay here to uh, to to live and to to produce in in Republic of Moldova. And with uh, fiscal incentives and with the adaptability that we discussed today, not one single time, I think uh, this uh, is um, uh, the thing that we must capitalize and uh, go forward with the business services. And uh, we will put a lot of effort to uh, prove that uh, definitely BS will be the, the one in the future. Thank you. And there's another speaker also on your panel. Oh. You, you can yeah, yeah. Uh, by ahead. the way, I forgot Mr. Jules, who also was uh, um, was invited to the event. But you know, nowadays we have a lot of flights. Only 30 uh, planes from Israel uh, last uh, day have landed to Kishino. We have 30,000 
of uh, people uh, in, in 10 days that will arrive in, in Moldova. So we become a, Moldova is a star now. <laughs> Everybody is arriving here. And Mr. Jules have not uh, managed to, to, to catch the plane. So uh, he will be with us with a short video of two minutes. Uh, I will uh, uh, give the, the, the video, I think, to... Or we should, uh, I think, uh, uh, climb down there because the, the video will be on there. You can step down. Thank you. Thank you, dear speakers, Hi, for Very being morning, people of value. From, uh, Budapest. Um, my name is Jules. I'm uh, working for Connect Minds. We are in conferences and events dedicated to the SSC GBS industry in the region. Uh, it's my really great pleasure to be able to share a few minutes of. Uh, insights uh, with you at this uh, very moment. I apologize that I cannot be there with you in person, um, but I would like to uh, still extend a very warm thank you to the organizers and uh, and also also wish a very, very big success to this first ever ABSL Moldova Summit. Congratulations to all of you guys for putting together uh, this event today. I'm sure it's going to be very inspiring and, and, and fruitful for all the participants. Uh, big congrats as well to uh, to the association for all you've done over the last year. Uh, it's the beginning of a great journey, and uh, and I very much hope that we will have the occasion to uh, to meet again in the future to discuss all the challenges. Um, I was asked to actually share with you a, a few of the cha challenges that I see are going in this industry that is very close to my heart. As I mentioned, we spend actually all our days researching with different. Uh, practitioners, leaders in the business services area to understand uh, what's going on, where the industry is going. And uh, our focus uh, nowadays is very much to actually think about 10 years down the line, what the industry will look like and what are the challenges that today um, the companies have to deal with in order to sustain operations and so on. So I was asked to share with you those kind of uh, thoughts and topics that, that come to mind. And uh, I just decided that for the sake of time and clarity, after all, it's, it's just one video and, and it's by definition boring. Um, I just wanted to share with you like three points that I figure are, are very, very important. So I don't really know whether this video will be played at the beginning or at the end of the session. So I hope I'm not repeating if nothing, uh, if I'm coming at the end. And uh, if I'm coming at, at the beginning, I hope it will also give some, uh, some good uh, ideas. To, to reflect on basically. So the first one, if you don't mind looking at my notes, the first one I wanted to, uh, to cover is obviously the people. It is a people industry uh, in need of a lot of, of, of people to, uh, to actually run through this. And uh, this people business is more and more in need of new and different skill sets. New activities being transitioned uh, require new and evolving skill sets. And I feel that today's, one of today's challenges is not only with the reskilling and upskilling of the people that you have within the centers, and we are talking a lot about AI, we are talking a lot about robotic, uh, talking about digitalization at large. Uh, it's not only about this, it's also having people that realize more and more the importance that they have within the entire value chain of the business. So it's not only understanding and being uh, proactive and an expert in one field, it's also understanding which role you actually play within the entire uh, business um, thing, which will come to my second point uh, later on about the business alignment. But one more thing on people is that today, it's of course, over the, over the last years, it has been very crucial for um, business, the business industry to actually attract talents. Uh, as I said, it's a people business that requires a lot of people. and. Over the last few years, the market has been quite overheated. We are talking every year about retention, about recruitment, about attrition rate, and so on. And, I, and obviously, this is not only the importance within the centers to grow their people, but also to actually work in collaboration with local organizations, universities, institutions, you name it, to actually make of this industry an industry of choice in the future. That's the topic number one. I covered a little bit topic number two because any, anyway it is closely linked. It's uh, about this need for an increased alignment with the business. I feel that if we are looking at the, the industry within the next five to ten years, there is a strong importance of having a 
seat at the decision making level, let's say. Not all the participants to our events or to our research are saying that they want to sit at the board, but all of them understand the power that they start to gain within this span of lifetime that they have in terms of developing their services and being an expert at it. They start to realize the value and the capabilities that they have in actually being among the decision-making leaders to be at the forefront of long-term strategies that are backed up by the incredible amount of data that the SSC and GBS today are sitting on and managing. The future will probably be on how to actually concretely leverage on those data in order to actually have data-backed decision-making that are more and more appreciated by, let's say, top-level management in order to make long-term strategic decision. And crucially, here in the, in the, in the CE region, the actual industry is sitting on a very strong, I would say, comparative or competitive advantage compared to other locations in the world because the people by definition that are employed in this industry are leaders. They are willing to actually move on mountains and what I see from the people that I research with is that when an organization has different centers across the world, very often the center that is here in CE or in, EA, uh, or in Europe, in EMEA, is actually leading the charge for globalization. They are very often considered as the one to go to to lead the, let's say, outsourcing strategy of the company. And I believe this is something that organizations have to leverage on in the future. And the last but not least uh, point that I would like to cover is about location. Location strategy, we have worked with, uh, with Moldova to discuss about being a destination of, uh, of choice for outsourcing. And here is the key. In Europe, nowadays, in, in the Central Eastern Europe, countries that are actually having a very strong uh, business, in, uh, business services industry, there is overheating on the market. Many, many things are done to actually expand this market and the growth is still here. And, uh, but one thing is true is that companies have started to look at other possible destinations. Uh, inflation has driven the cost very high and other countries have suddenly risen from being too costly to suddenly being affordable. Cost being one thing, um, availability of, wor of workforce being another one, and of course, the last is uh, this capability of the workforce. So nowadays, we see Portugal that, is, that was already a strong contender and Spain coming up as potential very good destination, Greece being one of them, and I absolutely don't see why Moldova, uh, now that they have set the path as a strategic decision from the, for the country to be a major player in this arena couldn't be in the future one of those as well. So I hope that those uh, very three quick points uh, will resonate with what the other panelists will be discussing about. Uh, to all of you guys, uh, sorry again that I couldn't be there with you. Um, I really hope you will have a very nice day. If uh, you have any questions or, or you feel like to reach out, uh, please get in touch with the organizers and I would be very happy to be connected with any of you guys. Have a very good day. Thank you so much for the time that has been given to me. Um, and uh, to all of you, hopefully see you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you. Uh, I would like to say also thank you to uh, our first panelists and thank you for being such great leaders. Thank you for being people of value, for valuing the business and services sector and for adding value to us, to the participants, by sharing your thoughts on the future trends in the business services. Also, I have a special announcement now. Not so good news, but also good news. I will start with not so good news. We'll have to take a break to prepare the next panels, but the good news is that this break is for lunch. So, please enjoy the lunch, have some refreshments, and we'll be back at around one o'clock to continue with the next panels. Thank you so much. faster than ever before.
Business Services Sector. The most resilient industry. First ABSL Summit in Moldova. Moldova, untapped near shoring destination. Dear participants, ladies and gentlemen, we are back from the break we had. I hope you have enjoyed the lunch break and the refreshments. Your energy of the batteries is up again, so we can continue our debates and our discussion. And we uh, move on to the next panel discussion. And we discuss about uh, probably the main asset, not the, just the business services sector, but also Moldova and globally, worldwide. Everything is done by the people and for the people. So the next panel will be focused on building a competitive business services workforce in Moldova. And I'm very happy to invite on stage the moderator of this panel, colleague, friend, Mariana Rufa, the executive director of European Business Association. Mariana, the floor is yours. Please welcome her. Honorable audience, dear ladies, dear gentlemen, I'm extremely honored and distinguished to moderate this very important panel, which was uh, entitled Building a Competitive Business Service Workforce in Moldova. And I will fully support what my uh, friend Andrei Krigan has mentioned, that the most important resource in any times, in any countries, is the human being, is the human resource which, in which we need to invest, which we need to support, and which we need to develop. Today, we have the utmost pleasure to have absolutely remarkable speakers alongside with us, because our organizers, whom I would like to congratulate for this absolutely phenomenal event, managed to make an extremely successful cohesion between the public sector between the private sector and, of course, academia. So, dear guests, allow me to invite Ms. Svetlana Gutsu, Head of General Recruitment Department, HR Consulting. Please help me to applaud and to support our speakers. Galina Russo, State Secretary, Minister of Education and Research of the Republic of Moldova. Ms. Felice Bechtold, State Secretary, Minister of Labor and Social Protection of the Republic of Moldova. Thank you very much. Ms. Felice Abano, Head of Department of Higher Education Evaluation. Anna Czech. Thank you. And Ms. Olesia Sirbu, Vice Director of International Relations Academy of Economic Studies of the Republic of Moldova. Once again, I would like to thank our distinguished speakers and to express our deepest gratitude for adjusting to the today's uh, agenda. And as we managed already to learn the important two words of the 21st century, this is resilience and adjustment. So dear ladies, thank you so much. Okay. Um, dear uh, ladies, dear gentlemen, uh, I will try to moderate this panel by uh, actually addressing a couple of uh, questions to our beloved speakers. But uh, from the very beginning, allow me to mention maybe two points uh, before uh, starting our discussion today. We all know that the EU candidacy that Moldova has generously obtained uh, recently uh, actually has committed the Republic of Moldova on the public sector, on the private sector, but also on the academia for a big series of reforms actions and new things, innovative things, in which we all have to embark on. It means that, first of all, it's the human resource and the people who need to adjust as employers on one side, but also as employees on the other side. 
So first of all, we have to commit and implement all the reforms. For this, we need to learn and to take over all the best practices and expertise on how to develop, to design these reforms, and then to implement them. Secondly, we have the front runner, who is the business. And today I represent the business association and I know that always the business is up front of any country willing to make the legislation not only working, but also applicable without any problems. So on the other side, we have businesses who need to really be able to implement the innovative legislation, which is right here with us today already. And last but not the least, we have the extremely important sector, which is the blood system of any country. This is the education sector. The one which is building our human resource and which, of course, has to adjust its curricula, its programs, to invest in its teachers and lectures so as to be able to invest also in the human resource. So we do have all of these components today. And by saying this, let me start our today's uh, discussion by <clears throat> addressing the first uh, question to... Um, the private sector to Svetlana Gutsu, whom we would like to um, mention from the point of view of an HR company. What's the demand on the market? What the market is willing today? What the companies are asking for? And what are probably the critical share of your requests for human resource? Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, to all the guests who came us uh, to join um, and for inviting uh, our company. Uh, probably you heard about HR Consulting, we are a recruiting agency, we started our activity in 1995. Uh, also we provide outsourcing services from uh, 2002. And, um, uh, as from our experience, in general, in the last four years, uh, we saw a big request from um, international businesses who are willing to come to Moldova, and this is despite of the pandemic and despite the war in Ukraine. Um, for example, uh, in 2021, uh, we had a request from an international company who were specialized in online banking. And the request was to find sales, sales and customer support uh, operators uh, who are willing to work remotely and with good customer service skills. So our task was to make like market research to see uh, approximate salary for that kind of uh, positions. Uh, and we did a very good job because we found uh, for the beginning in two months, we found like 10 um, tell people who started their work in that company. Um, and this company now is one of the um, most popular, I guess, uh, fintech company in Moldova. Um, I, I heard that uh, it will be a fintech conference and they are like a golden uh, partner of that conference. So um, it is glad that companies are coming and we can find for them good specialists in the area. Also, we have a good collaboration with automotive companies. For example, in the beginning of this year, um, a new automotive company came to Comrade City. It's in the south of Moldova. Uh, and we easily found for them a production manager, an HR specialist. Okay, it was not very easy because, you know, in that area there are many speakers of Russian and uh, they don't know very well English, but um, um, gladly another automotive industries who are already working uh, on, on the market, we found a good specialist from them. Uh, so, also we have an IT department, IT uh, uh, team, I'm glad that they are near me today. Um, and uh, they saw a big request for um, uh, machine learning knowledges. Uh, also, for example, the request for graphic designers changed to UI and UX. Um, and in general, they had very many requests for developers, especially Python developers. Uh, 
as an evolution, for example, from, from the recruiting agency, uh, we just yesterday talked with uh, our general manager and uh, he told me that uh, in 1995, when he just started, uh, it was interesting that the, the most popular position was a sales representative because you work for a corporate uh, or you work in a good pharmacy company and they provide you car and it was super fancy to work as a sales representative. Um, starting with uh, 2010, uh, the automotive industries came to Moldova, which is very good because they developed the infrastructures, not only in Chisinau, but in other cities of Moldova. Uh, they gave like places of work and uh, now for example an automotive industry who are willing to come to Moldova they know that they already uh, can have qualified specialists like productions manager, uh, quality technicians uh, and so on. Uh, then for, for example when I was a student it was in 2013 as I remember, um, it was uh, very many advertisements of uh, the call centers that if you know English, you can uh, easily start your career and have like from 500 euros per month. And then we understood with our colleagues that we have to learn English because we know we will have a motivated salary. Uh, and that was really good because now um, the, um, the companies who provide customer service, when they are coming to Moldova, they see that our specialists are really qualified in that. They know how to speak with clients, they know how to um, manage the stressful situations for them. And um, yes, it was, um, it was good. Uh, and gladly uh, because of the IT park in 2018, when they were founded, uh, many IT companies came. And uh, in our companies, we needed to make changes. We, we needed to divide the recruitment department in two teams. So four recruiters were adjusted just to work on uh, one IT recruitment. Uh, and now we see that uh, IT positions are more and more. And um, as, as a conclusion, we can say that uh, many positions are in customer service and uh, in fintech, which is now more, yes, yes. Um, if we are talking about the candidates in general, um, our Moldova market is, um, is rich in qualified candidates. The main uh, willing for them is to have a motivated salary they are looking for uh, employer branding. That means that when they are working in a company, they want that company to have values and to think about their employees. Um, so that is. Uh, thank you very much. I think that this was really an extremely uh, relevant and important information for our uh, colleagues from the public sector, but also for our academia and maybe also for the ongoing education, because we should all understand that it's absolutely normal over the lives time to maybe upgrade your career at a certain stage and maybe one of the drawbacks in the Republic of Moldova is to really the, to, to ensure the development of the ongoing education after you have the degree at the Academy of Economic Studies or master degree, but to really have the opportunity to have your necessary upgrades if you discover a certain sector more appropriate for you. However, uh, without any sound policies, that we would be able to build on our um, HR uh, recruitment and uh, to be able to meet the demand, it will be indeed impossible to, to build the market overall. So uh, I have my utmost pleasure to give the floor to the uh, State Secretary of the Ministry of uh, Education uh, and Research of the Republic of Moldova, Ms. Galina Russo, to tell us really about these policies, what is the input and the effort of the Ministry of Education in order to really adjust to the new demands, what are the policies and the interventions and the changes that managed to happen so far in order to respond to this absolutely dynamic changes that happen, have happened so far in the Republic of Moldova. 
Ms. Galina Russo, please. Thank you. Thank you so much for uh, inviting uh, me to be part of this event. And um, as we are here all together, uh, it's uh, a normal, uh, in, uh, from my point of view, of a synergy that we can construct all together in order to have uh, a very well prepared um, human, uh, human resource for, uh, for our country and uh, uh, for the international area also. Uh, so, uh, from the, for the Ministry of Education and Research, maybe more than ever, uh, a main objective um, is now the, the preparation of, um, of a, a qualified um, human resource uh, for the country. And uh, we more than ever understand that uh, we have to. Uh, match to adjust and to make relevant the qualifications that um, uh, that, that we give uh, in our educational uh, uh, system and to uh, make as closer pos as possible the educational system to the labor market uh, of the country. Uh, I would start with the uh, the moment that where we are uh, um, with the educational system of uh, of the country, and uh, I will say that. Uh, our qualification system is very closed and is adjusted to the European qualification system. That means that the diplomas or the qualifications that we give are, um, are understood uh, by the, the not only European community but also the global one. That means that uh, what we prepared is uh, adjusted uh, to what it is needed at the, at the global area. Uh, in order to push our um, uh, educational providers, here I mean vetted institutions, uh, universities, to be closer to, their, uh, to the market needs, uh, we ask all the programs that are developed now to be uh, um, developed and projected uh, according to the uh, qualification standards that are developed according to the occupational standards and together with the economic sector. So we push our providers to uh, make this uh, quality assurance, um, assurance process. Then uh, we organize at the uh, qualification level, I mean uh, the final exams, to be more uh, clear. Uh, we pushed our providers to organize this exam together with the economic sector in order to uh, understand that we prepare exactly the, uh, what we need. We understand more than ever that the diplomas, the qualifications that we get now can be um, not unuseful, but less useful in the next, it can be three, time, uh, three years if you speak about IT or five years. And of course we can uh, very, uh, not very easy to say that what a qualification got 20 years ago is, uh, is needed on the market today. So in this direction we uh, understand and we open many uh, possibilities and many different programs. By the way, uh, at the European level now, we speak about so-called micro-credentials, meaning micro-masters, micro-license, meaning that we speak about very short and very focused programs that are needed in the market, not in, I don't know, two years, but now, today, and um, uh, we open the area, I mean policy area, we develop now a, the policy area in the direction that uh, the educational providers, universities, uh, vet institutions will be able to do them together with the economic sector. So, um, and also economic agents will be also be able to provide this uh, um, many courses very, very useful for, uh, for uh, the career of uh, our citizens. Uh, 
Uh, I want also to mention that one um, strategic uh, uh, action that we did at the Ministry of Education, we developed in more in the last two years. Uh, by the way, uh, together with uh, our uh, partners from, uh, from uh, different countries and on the example, having the example of uh, other countries, we developed the policies concerning dual education. And here uh, I also uh, want to point attention that dual means uh, two parts. So the educational system and um, the, um, the, the economic uh, system, that the market, um, labor market together. To, to prepare, uh, to, to train our, um, uh, our human resource in order to, to have them prepared exactly concerning what, um, uh, what we need uh, in, uh, in the area. And, uh, and uh, one more, um, one more uh, point that uh, I, uh, I would also um, uh, uh, would like to mention is that we have the, uh, the, not world, but the existent qualification that we understand and we work together on, on the updating the curricula, the program and so on, but also we understand and we are open and we open new programs that are needed uh, today and maybe no, uh, no one uh, could uh, imagine some years ago, uh, today we speak all, uh, all of us, uh, we speak uh, about uh, artificial intelligence, about virtual reality and so on and uh, of course we are in the open to, to develop these new programs in order to be uh, in, um, in touch with the, the time and uh, in, in the same uh, step. And uh, yes, uh, in, in, in the idea of, uh, of uh, uh, have a, to have a synergy in, in the preparation of our uh, human um, resources, I would give uh, the, the, the example of uh, IT sector uh, that of course uh, shows how they govern with their policies, uh, um, then the educational system, then the, the economical sector all together work and now are working also in, during the program, preparation, the, the, the human resource, and all together could push this sector in a very short period of time uh, to be so important and, uh, and um, uh, giving uh, a, very, um, a, a very good benefit to, to, to our country and also to, to show that we can and to change the image of our country through these uh, talented uh, people. So uh, I will end with the, the moment, let's do it for, uh, uh, for uh, uh, service sector, but for different sectors all together in order to have uh, the human resource that we, uh, we want to have in our country. So thank you. Ms. Galina Russo, thank you so much. I think that these are extremely positive uh, messages because indeed if to take the IT sector we are speaking about the growth of up to 25% as a share of GDP. Of course, uh, it is also an example, at least in the Republic of Moldova, where uh, together in a team spirit all the uh, stakeholders like academia, Ministry of Education, Ministry of uh, Social Protection, uh, Family and Child at that stage, and now Ministry of Social Protection, uh, and also with um, academia, with IT uh, University, I mean, with the technical university, but also other universities already, and the private sector, but with a great support from GIZ, actually, managed to provide um, absolutely exclusive synergy and a boom happened in this sector 
And now the IT is, of course, extremely attractive. We have the businesses who are supporting different kinds of laboratories. So my message is that that would be indeed, Ms. Russo, a very good reference for the other sectors to catch upon and do the same in order to build uh, the, the market in the area. So thank you very much for your messages. But indeed, we have the social protection side. And uh, we also have the uh, social policies that have been developed in the meanwhile and that have been adjusted to all of these demands on the market. And thank you very much, Ms. Felicia Bertholdt, who is the State Secretary of the uh, Ministry of Labor and Social Protection of the Republic of Moldova, and who are now probably in an extremely dynamic agenda in this EU candidacy marathon, which we have to uh, enable and um, accomplish. What has happened with the policies in the social protection area, Ms. Bertholdt? Thank you so much. I am so excited to be here. Um, I'm a labor economist uh, as a profession. This is my profession. So every time when I am being invited to talk about the workforce, I am just very excited. I can talk about this hours and hours and hours. Yes, indeed. Um, building a competitive workforce is so important for a country's economic development and prosperity, especially in the light of uh, European uh, accession. And indeed, for us, it's a marathon. It's a real marathon. We don't have a break. Uh, <laughs> um, what I want to say is that it's so important for educational institutions, uh, for the Ministry of Labor and Social Protection, the Ministry of Education, for educational institutions to work together and provide uh, you know, all the knowledge, all the technical and practical skills to our workforce. You know, business services is a wide range of industries. You know, it comprises banking, financing, accounting, uh, business research and analysis. So this industry requires people that have strong technical and analytical skills, but also that require soft skills, you know, communication, interpersonal skills, excellent customer service skills, um, emotional intelligence, and so on. 2023 uh, is the year um, of skills that was declared by the European Union. And um, I must, I, I want to say that, um, you know, it's really important for our future workforce to develop some of the soft skills, you know, starting from an early age. You know, you can do that by volunteering. Uh, you can do that while you are at the university doing multiple internships. We've seen many times that when students uh, graduate, you know, they only have one internship. But, you know, these skills, you can learn them from early on. And uh, I think some, some kids or some young people have, you know, maybe some pride of not accepting a job, you know, at a call center or maybe to be a waiter or a bartender. But I think it's so important to have, to start to have these experiences from early on because um, it, you know, you gain so much experience and so many skills that will help you later once you get, you know, uh, a job uh, later on. Um, another thing that I would like to uh, talk about is that, um, you know, sometimes employers are not that open to provide internships for students that are in universities. And, you know, if we, if as employers would like to have, you know, these young people that are graduating and we want them prepared, we need to spend time with them. We need to dedicate time to teach them. And this is an excellent opportunity for you to choose the right person after that person uh, graduates. Um, another thing that I want to mention, you know, I lived eight years in the United States and when I was going to the bank there and I, um, uh, you know, the person that was uh, providing me the service, the bank teller, she did not have a bachelor's degree in finance. She did not have a, or he or she did not have a bachelor's degree in, in banking services or accounting. Uh, you know, what it's only needed is to have a high school diploma and usually a one month on the job training. I think we have a huge challenge in Moldova as other countries in Europe, North America, you know, we have a short 
labor shortage. Uh, we have a huge shortage of the labor force, and it's really important for us to use the labor force in an efficient way, to use our talent in an efficient way. So, you know, in the U.S., they will never hire someone with, a with an undergraduate degree in finance or banking services to be a bank teller. They would use those skills for other types of jobs. You know, I want to bring another example like uh, financial analysts or I would say financial clerks or billing clerks is the same situation. You know, what is all required over there is just to have a high school diploma and on the job training and that can be done by employers. Um, and another aspect that I want to mention is that employers in Moldova are competing with employers in European Union. Uh, and you know, um, and in order to attract and retain that labor force, you don't only need to provide them an interesting experience for uh, the future workers, but you also need to provide, uh, you know, uh, higher salaries because you're competing on that, uh, flexible schedules, uh, really good opportunities for your workers. And why I'm saying that, I know a lot of people will say, well, when I started, this is how it was. You know, like I had to start from the bottom. I did all of those, you know, repetitive tasks or routine tasks. But the workforce is changing and we need to change uh, with the workforce as well. You know, right now, young people, they want to have great experiences that are having an impact uh, on the workplace, on their communities. So it's, it's uh, really important to, uh, you know, be open and, and provide that. Another thing that I want to mention about the uh, labor force is, you know, if we look at women. Women with the age of 25 to 49, you know, their uh, labor force participation rate is only 39% in Moldova women that have children under the six uh, years old. So that's basically 23% less than uh, men of the same age, 25 to 49, that have children under the age of six, and that's uh, also 23% less than women that don't have children. We are missing a huge potential if we don't provide you know, more flexible schedules for women, if we don't provide, um, you know, part-time job opportunities for women in order to return to the workforce. I understand we all have important demands, but if we want to uh, retain our competitive workforce, um, we need to do that. So what I want to say is that it's not just only about building a competitive workforce, but it's also about retaining it, that competitive workforce. Um, if we look also at people with disabilities, for example, like we have uh, such remarkable, you know, people with disabilities that have amazing skills. Nevertheless, you know, our employment rate for people with disabilities is barely, you know, above 10%. We have a huge, uh, you know, potential that we can uh, explore. Um, so, um, another thing that I want to mention about what the Ministry of Labor, specifically uh, Ministry of Labor and Social Protection does in order to address the gaps in the labor force is that uh, every year uh, we are developing occupational standards for uh, vocational uh, education. Uh, this is, you know, very important because based on this occupational standards, then the Ministry of Education and Research is developing educational standards. And then all the educational institutions must follow these educational standards. But it's not us, the Ministry of Labor and Social Protection, that does this. It's the business associations. It's you, the employers. So every year we have about 2 million lei, which is about 100,000 euros, uh, a budget to develop about 22 occupational standards. And I want to take this opportunity 
and say, if you have in mind an occupational standard that we need to develop, we are happy to receive your requests and to put it uh, for the next year uh, in our list of occupational standards. And um, so we need to enhance the communication with businesses, including in this regard, to communicate it more, to kind of have it. Yes, more yes, up. we do receive, we actually do receive from, uh, you know, um, uh, employers. Uh, we, we usually receive independent requests from employers, but also from government authorities if they need a occupational standard and then what is and but I also want to say we receive also from the Ministry of Education and Research yes uh, they are the one that we are listening first <laughs> uh, yes this is because if we will have all the package of uh, educational standards for the our system we will be more credible for the European and not only market and our qualifications where we will have the entire package uh, will be recognized uh, globally. So you see we push uh, one each other to, to go further, yeah. And we pay you for that. So if you want to develop an occupational standard, just form a committee apply and you're gonna get paid for that. And we have, as I mentioned, two million lay for occupational standards every year. That's about 100,000 euros. So um, another thing that I wanna mention what the Ministry of Labor and Social Protection does in building a competitive workforce is right now we are undergoing through an ambitious reform of the National Employment Agency. So as part of this reform, uh, we're planning to develop, uh, in fact, right now we're working on this regulations to develop, a, uh, to create a division within the National Employment Agency that will be relations with employers. So uh, I, we hope that this will enhance uh, the collaboration among um, the National Employment Agency staff with employers. As well, we passed one piece of legislation last year where we introduced vouchers for uh, professional training courses. And I want to tell you this program is so popular that we spend all the money for the entire year by July. We don't have any more money for, uh, you know, job seekers that want to um, follow a professional training course. And it's also popular among educational system because prior to that, educational institutions had to go through the uh, procurement process in order to be part of this program, but now they don't need to do that. So we um, increased the pool of educational institutions that are participating in this program and that also helped us to increase the number of occupations that we are offering to job seekers. As well, I want to mention this piece of legislation, um, we increased subsidies. So the employers that are offering internships, employers that are offering on-the-job training, um, we provide financial incentives to hire uh, job seekers that are registered uh, through the National Employment Agency and we increased uh, those financial incentives. And that also helped us to uh, really spend all the money for the entire year. And this program is very popular. Um, we have requested additional funding uh, from the Ministry of Finance and we really hope that we will uh, receive that. So, um, so yeah, you know, uh, be in tune into that. And um, what else that I want to mention? Oh, another thing very important. So, as part of the reform of the National Employment Agency, we are not only looking to improve our job matching between the job seekers and employers, but we want to improve really the quality of the services. And as part of that, uh, we will pilot mobile teams with the support of GIZ, UNDP, and ILO that will help us uh, to uh, go in different communities and uh, attract the inactive people into the labor market. Uh, but we're planning that to do that in all the 35 rayons. So this is not going to be just a pilot. This is what's going to uh, uh, we're planning on, on having these mobile teams in, in each uh, rayon. So, 
you know, we're, we're doing a lot of things, but I think for now I'll just stop. But if you have any questions, I would be happy, you know, to answer. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Bechtold. I think that these were extremely important and informative messages. As uh, uh, being the executive director of the European Business Association, I can tell you that uh, the business community has been working of, over the years and even now very closely with the ministry. And uh, besides the um, uh, achievements that you have uh, very well mentioned, uh, we have uh, also brought a change altogether uh, in the amendments of the Labour Code, uh, which also includes the um, participation of the la labour market of the pregnant women, a recent amendment. Again, very, very important for, for the women. Uh, also, the possibility of the employer and to deduct the costs for different kind of arrangements for the um, uh, childcare to have it at the workplace, which is extremely important to save the labor force. And there were plenty of other amendments which we consider extremely important, uh, especially under the condition when you want and intend to keep the labor force in the country so precious in nowadays. So thank you so much for all your effort. Business is here, always happy to cooperate because it's also in our interest. However, if we go further to Ms. Felicia Bano, who is uh, representing the ANACEC, the state agency, uh, in the area of the programs that are developed for the private sector. Here we're speaking about the accredited programs uh, related to the education sector. So, Ms. Felicia Bano, if you can share with us, please, what are the current programs that you have managed to, to accredit already, considering the demand on the market, and maybe if you already have some plans for the future. Thank you so much. Thank you so much uh, to uh, the organizer for organization of such uh, an event and for inviting uh, us uh, to participate at this event. Um, I would like to say that um, the connection between uh, education and labor market um, is uh, a demand, uh, not uh, nowadays, but uh, in the course of time. Uh, our legal framework um, stipulates that the um, uh, universities or um, educational institutions providing education that uh, want to improve the educational offer with new study programs must um, uh, undergo uh, on the process of um, external evaluation. Nation, um, National Agency for Quality Assurance in Education and Research annually receive requests from uh, all higher education institutions. Um, I can say that um, almost all universities um, um, demand um, uh, for um, um, opening new study programs. In the last year, um, we received from uh, universities uh, different requests from IT uh, sector. They want to um, improve um, their educational offer with programs at the um, bachelor level and master level uh, from with the economic study programs and as well IT, education and uh, many others. Uh, another aspect that I, uh, aspect that I uh, want to stress here is that in the external evaluation process, doesn't matter if it is for accreditation or provisional authorization, we invite the representative um, of the labor market in our panel in order to um, uh, make them to have a voice uh, to check if uh, the programs that uh, uh, university, uh, universities uh, develop um, are according to the requirements of uh, the labor market needs. And um, in this perspective, um, I would like as well to mention that um, um, our agency um, is uh, taking into consideration that all um, universities develop programs according to the labor market needs. Thank you. 
Ms. Bano, thank you so much. Uh, Ms. Felicia uh, Bano is the head of Department of Higher Education Evaluation in Anacek, and when we were having the coffee break, I was actually absolutely impressed to see among the programs, already accredited programs in data analytics, data management, uh, IT processing, so extremely up-to-date and market-related and demand-driven programs that Moldova, despite of any difficulties is trying to catch up. So, Ms. Felicia Bano, please accept my personal congratulations for all of this effort because it's not easy uh, to, to really manage and prepare the, the market, the students, without having enough expertise. But we, you know, we are trying, we are attracting, we're involving the business, so it's a great achievement. Yes, Ms. Galina. Uh, yeah, yes, uh, and I, I would like also to mention that uh, it uh, it looks that uh, it will op open a new market, uh, this Absolutely. area of IT, uh, having in mind uh, game design, multimedia production, uh, animation, uh, data analysis, uh, also in the direction of uh, artificial intelligence and uh, uh, not only that we open these new programs, but the university were open, and we have also uh, the support of, uh, uh, of some um, partners in order to improve the quality of the teachers for these programs, and uh, our teachers participate in, uh, in some uh, trainings abroad in order to, to develop new, these new programs. And it's a very high speed that the programs were open, this, uh, these new programs were open only last year, and we have hundreds of students that uh, applied not only for the budget places, but also for play, uh, paid places. And it it looks like the companies are very open and uh, at least at this moment it looks like that it will open a new service uh, module, let's say, in this uh, media production, game design and so on. So we, we put uh, our um, okay, aim and uh, we, we, we think it will uh, be also a new direction IT that will develop uh, very, very fast. But yeah. Ms. Galina, on this occasion, I'd like to really encourage our donors. Uh, I'm looking at the JZ uh, current, but also it's about to EU, it's about to any other donors that are uh, providing support to in the market because if we do have such an important um, uh, upgrade of the education sector by including such important and relevant uh, programs, it's really uh, about providing support to teachers, to those who will uh, share the expertise. And uh, to give you very simple examples, I know personally some of the extremely intelligent guys that uh, graduated the high school this year. They were planning to go into Netherlands, but when they heard that a faculty on game design uh, there is in the technical university they remained at home. I accepted this news with tears in my eyes because these are extremely intelligent guys who really made the choice to stay at home. So we need to invest into our teachers and this we can do only with our donors considering the scarce budget that we have in Moldova. So please consider the request. Thank you so much. And um, last but not the least uh, we uh, should understand that uh, without academia uh, Ms. Banu, you wanted to say something, sorry. If you want to add, uh, please. Okay. Um, we, we actually have a very uh, active academia in the Republic of Moldova. Even EBA has a very strong cooperation with the Academy of Economic Studies, with the Technical University, with a State University, in which we have our teachers who are uh, trying to catch up with market demand and to really prepare the students for, for the labor market. Um, if uh, if we can learn about from um, Ms. Uh, Olesia Sirbu, who is the Vice Rector for the International Relations Academy of Economic Studies of Moldova, what are the maybe recent faculties or programs that have been recently opened or maybe uh, the programs in which you manage successfully to update the curricula in order to meet the demand on the market, especially when we are speaking about consulting services and BPOs. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for being invited here. Um, it's a very interesting topic, and it's really demanding. Uh, I will be shortly just presenting the experience of the public university, uh, Academy of Economic Studies of Moldova, in our issues of today's discussion. 
Uh, being as a vice rector for international relations, also I'm um, uh, dealing with the designing and coordination of the international projects. Mostly we are leaders as university in Moldova uh, in designing and uh, being funded by the European Commission in the Erasmus uh, program, dealing with the uh, building, uh, capacity building of higher education. So we are coordinating, I'm personally a grand coordinator of five uh, structural projects. And in this case, I would like to complete my calling from the ministry, Mrs. Russo, that mostly we are not pushed uh, by the ministry. We are working in a collaborative approach. And this is very important. I would like to say that the ministry really engaged in our needs. And in our project, because when you are designing an international project, you know that you have to design needs and uh, uh, different obstacles, problems. So therefore, coming from our needs, so in all of these projects, we have a bottom-up approach. So we have a needs, we are designing all our projects, they are structural projects. That means that our ministry is a full partner in our projects, uh, financed by the European Commission. So therefore, everything we are doing in a collaborative way. And uh, in this case, uh, any actions, any regulations which we're designing uh, are done together. So, and in this case, uh, in implementation and creation of the mechanism of the implementation of different legislative changes uh, are going very smoothly. So, several examples. Um, in 2020, we designed a project uh, having experience in the United States of America on a cooperative education. So we came back and we decided it was a, just a case when JZ was implementing uh, the dual education uh, on the vocational level. So I was thinking why not we have such things in the higher education. So always in the reforming our higher education, uh, especially Academy of Economic Studies because I'm graduated this institution and till today I'm um, working uh, inside of this University. Uh, I was really ambitious, uh, knowing that our students and being a student, of course, and speaking about full time students, when you're permanently on the lectures and graduating the university, you would like to go to the company, and all companies, of course, are asking degree, but then they're asking experience at least three years and how the students can get this experience. So having this uh, really exchange of experience from the United States, and then we found good partner in the European Union. It's a general cooperative university. They bring to us this uh, way of uh, cooperation with the industry, with the business society. Together we designed that the business partners, they have to be involved in the curriculum development. Then now uh, we are the first university, we have partners, Technical University and ULIM, International Free University of Moldova, as a private one, which we took as an example. So mostly together with the Technical University, but Technical University is dealing with the engineering and robotic faculty. And Academy of Economic Studies, we have a faculty of business administration when we have the mostly bigger number of students. And the IT, uh, we have IT um, not to become competitive, of course, with the technical university, but our focus in the academy, it's in, uh, informational technologies for business intelligence. So our programs mostly are dealing with the economic fields with IT, so cross um, um, cooperation in these fields. So we have two faculties which are implementing now dual programs. Dual, um, because uh, when I was invited, my administration said that you have to go and to speak about our dual programs. Speaking about programs with the double degree diploma, which we have several with the, our international universities. But of course, when we are speaking about dual education, that means um, some people are mixing this uh, an approach, uh, even in my academy, and it was necessary to discuss and to say that this is a work-based education. 
which is like an umbrella. And when we are speaking about different options of implementing this approach in the university, then we have internship, then we have participation of business representatives in our lectures, uh, or any kind of consortium in designing curriculum. And one of these approaches is also dual. Dual means that, or cooperative in the American uh, style to say, that we have a tripartite contract. We have a contract between the university, between the company, and the student. These three uh, entities are signing a contract at the beginning of the studies. And I would like to say that we are the first, together with the technical university, uh, universities who are piloting this type of uh, education, of course, having different problems, obstacles, uh, but as a result of one year of piloting, I would like to say that next year we increased the number of students 100% to these groups, to the, the faculty. So students are uh, selecting this type of education. Of course, remaining the strong students, so it's like a natural selection because when you're going to the classical uh, studies, classic studies, then you have only lectures and then you're free. In the dual classes, students are having 60% in the class uh, room um, education and 40% they have to go to the company. That means that their employees, they're employed by this company, they're working there, they have a special mentor who is working with them, uh, and then they have it in the classroom and what is their result of such education. So the, we noticed that the students, uh, of course they're paid. Uh, also this is a financial also support to the students. They have a salary. During the studies, when you're finalizing bachelor degree, you are getting three years of experience. You're understanding the process at your company better. And when you are coming to the theory or in the classroom, you're understanding this and the students are completely different in this case. So they're well educated in this case, understanding the real process in the company. And the third one, they are getting this experience and financial support, so this is very important. I would like to say that together with the ministry, we are working with the Department of uh, Higher Education Policy and with the Lifelong Learning Department. Um, and in this case, we managed to initiate the um, amendments to the Code of Education inserting dual education for higher level, higher education level, so this is our first. Then will be the second, we are developing white paper, because not everyone understanding what does mean work-based uh, uh, education, even we have to educate our academic uh, society and students, and we will develop the guidelines. Ah, not, sorry, and we will develop the guidelines for the implementation uh, because each university then will uh, have to uh, design this regulation on the institutional level. Additionally to the things I would like to express, um, thank very much the ministry supporting another idea. We submitted last year to the European Commission and we have been selected uh, having again the new one structural project dealing with the fostering tracking of employability of the graduates. And here we will cooperate also with the Ministry of Labor because uh, the future, the motto of Academy of Economic Studies is university engaging future. So we are trying to be at least with one step in advance. And we know that the future is for the non-classical universities. And therefore now we have in our focus to develop education on distance. Uh, with a really a real focus on the education on distance, and another one to become a uh, university with the biggest number and degree of uh, employed students. So this is our, and uh, together, and we have three years in front of us, together with both ministries to develop regulation. It will be national platform, which where everyone can see which is the big, uh, which is the best university when the graduates then have uh, ways for employment. Uh, and uh, this portal will be managed by the ministry, so, and uh, everything will be transparent. So this is a shortly how we are implementing and what are doing the uh, university in the field to graduate our uh, students to be real competitive on the labor market. Thank you. Ms. Uh, Olesia Sirbu, thank you so much. Uh, so we are...
gratefully applauding for your messages, Vice Rector for International Relations Academy of Economic Studies. Uh, dear colleagues, we are actually coming to an end of our panel uh, with the title uh, of Building a Competitive Business Services Workforce in Moldova. Uh, allow me at this stage to uh, really express our gratitude to the organizers of this event. I will not uh, mention for sure all of them, but this is the JZ, this is the investment agency of the Republic of Moldova. Uh, and uh, these are all the partners that I am not mentioning now, uh, but they have really decided to support such an important event, which is for the first time uh, implemented in the Republic of Moldova. And maybe next time we should also invite the regions uh, and our uh, business hubs or stakeholders from the regions because it's such an important area and industry which we have to support. And uh, also allow me to express uh, our gratitude to our speakers today. So I would like to kindly ask you to uh, express our gratitude with applauses to um, Ms. Svetlana Gutsu, Head of General Recruitment Department, HR Consulting. Ms. Galina Rusu, State Secretary of Ministry of Education and Research of the Republic of Moldova. Ms. Felicia Bechtold, State Secretary, Minister of Labor and Social Protection of the Republic of Moldova. Ms. Felicia Banu, Head of Department of Higher Education Evaluation, Anna Czech. Ms. Olesia Sirbu, Vice Rector of International Relations Academy of Economic Studies. And my name is Mariana Rufa, Executive Director of the European Business Association in the Republic of Moldova. Thank you so much and wish you a very successful event further on. Thank you, dear ladies. Of course, a photo is uh, necessary. Thank you so much. We enjoyed very much um, your speeches and uh, the value you have shared with us. And um, now we believe more and more that uh, the main asset is here, can be developed, and can increase the jump of the, the capacity of, uh, of the next job for, for the business services sector in Moldova. Thank you so much. And um, I would like to, Mariana actually mentioned the, the strategic partners uh, of ABSL Summit for intermediary remarks from the initiative of um, German cooperation uh, that is implemented by JZ. I am very delighted to invite here a special speaker, Mrs. Uh, Karin Horhan, head of uh, the program Strong Businesses and Communities for Moldova from JZ Moldova. Please welcome her. So, okay. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, it is a great pleasure for me as uh, head of the, this program um, to be here today. GIZ is a German government-owned organization for international development. And yeah, we are very proud to have been supporting ABSL and in particular this summit, which is thanks to the funding of the German and the Swiss um, government. So, well, actually, this is not closing remarks, of course, because the event is still about to continue. But what I can uh, say already uh, now at this stage is that I'm really impressed with the event uh, so far. A lot of inspirations, a lot of uh, triggering of additional uh, thoughts. Because a lot of topics that uh, have been discussed would merit a whole event in uh, themselves. So we uh, talked about and heard about uh, the role of artificial intelligence. This is something we also intensively discuss uh, within GIZ and in Germany in general. We discuss about the future work environment. What does it mean for a new generation? What do you need to offer as an employer to be attractive? This is a big question for the German private sector and again also for us as uh, GIZ. 
Then uh, a very important topic which was raised in the panel before, the inclusion of women uh, in the labor market, especially uh, at this stage in life when uh, you have small children. So what can a government do, but also what can an employer do? Um, and many more uh, topics. And well, the answer to these questions are not easy and uh, probably there is not this the one answer. It, it depends, it depends on the circumstances in a country, it depends on uh, your resources. And, uh, but I don't think that there is ever a one-size-fits-all uh, approach to anything. But what we can do, and this is what we want to support, we, we want to support learning from each other, we want to support networking, because it's exactly through these kind of events where you get maybe new ideas, you talk to people you have not talked before, we look at examples from other countries um, and then try to uh, try to pick what what is suitable to our context. So what I want to say is that these kind of events are really so useful um, uh, for that, and so uh, I'm very proud that we could uh, support that. And but I've been relatively new to the Republic of Moldova, but what impressed me really a lot in these couple of uh, weeks that I have been here is. Um, and it, I think it was mentioned before several times, adap adaptability, uh, that's the word. Um, because yes, uh, of course the, the circumstances are very difficult and in particular for the Republic of Moldova. But it's then to a certain extent always uh, also the question, how, what do you do with it? difficult or challenging environment. You can analyze it and analyze it again and um, be uh, upset about it or lament about it. Or you can just, well, at a certain point, even accept it and say, okay, there are things we cannot change right now, but let's look at, uh, are there any opportunities in a difficult situation? So exactly what was mentioned before um, by the speakers and uh, see what, uh, what is maybe even positive in it. But for some circumstances, okay, you, you don't find any positivity, but you can look at the future. You can look at, uh, okay, nevertheless, what can we do? And this positive attitude, this is what really I found very impressive. And I've been working in many countries over the last, um, decades even, <laughs> and uh, this is a big difference um, that I see is how, how is a population, how is a country, how is a government dealing in face of challenges. And um, so resilience, adaptability, keeping a positive spirit, this is uh, I think a key factor for success and uh, very remarkable uh, how much this was expressed today. And yeah, I'm very optimistic about the future <laughs> of uh, the Moldovan private sector. And we, as she had said, we are here to uh, keep supporting you, to uh, accompanying you on this path. And uh, so I'm looking forward to the rest of the event. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mrs. Horhan. And welcome to Moldova once again, since you're here for a short time, but we hope that you'll be longer with us. And thank you for, for the positive attitude, for the positive vibes, and for your optimism and belief in, uh, in the business and services sector and in us. And thank you to German Corporation and JZ for being a strategic partner and offering that much support. So we continue the forum with the next panel. And the next panel is about successful business services operations in Moldova. So we'll hear from successful businessmen, successful entrepreneurs, successful managers about this one. And for chairing this panel, I am very delighted to invite uh, Mrs. Lilia sinchuk engelin the honorary president of ABSL Moldova. Let's say so the guardian angel. Can, we, can I say that? Yes, we can welcome her. And thank you for your efforts and value.
Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you very much to be with us today. I don't want to take too much time, and I want to really go already into panel. I want to invite all my uh, panelists, Alexandra Guzun, Margarita Melnik, uh, Larisa Adamova, and Daniela Viktor. Please join the stage. Thank you. to introduce um, uh, the panelists, the distinguished panelists and important representative of the business service sector. First of all, I want to start with Alexandro. Alexandro Guzun is he is a director of Pricewaterhouse Moldova. Having 18 years of professional experience, since 2004, he has been actively involved in development and implementation of public policies, including those relevant for European integration process of Moldova. Alexandro is also president of Amcham Moldova and a board member of European Business uh, Association. He has a bachelor degree in psychology and of course me an uh, MBA diploma. Please your applause to Alexander. <laughs> Our next uh, panelist to introduce is uh, Margarita Melnichuk. She is the legal director of country manager of Pedersen and Partners Moldova. Mrs. Melnichuk has over 23 years of extensive experience in finance, also a bachelor degree in accounting and in economic law, and also three executive MBA diploma from Toulouse Business School. Your applause for our high, super high qualified, qualified workforce in Moldova. Larissa Adamova is the next um, panelist that I want to introduce. She has marketing experience derived from the banking sector. Also, she has background in project planning and execution in telecommunication field. And her journey with Viatel company began in the capacity of a project manager. In this role, she embraced the opportunity to share her invaluable expertise with the team, fostering a dynamic and collaborative environment. Please, environment. Please your applause to Mrs. Larissa. And last but not least, Daniela. We are, I think, together in the journey already practically 20 years. And she was a great supporter of ABSL Moldova and always a supporter of Moldova in general. She is the country manager of uh, uh, SRS Moldova. More than 10 years experience in people management, operational management, change management, passionate about growing people, building teams, and achieving together great results. In professional and a personal life focused on continuous improvement. Please, your applause to Mrs. Daniela. In the beginning, I would like, in order to be able to understand the success, success story of our um, uh, panelists here in the Republic of Moldova, I would like to address a question to Mr. Alexander. How did Pricewaterhouse learn that Moldova may be a regional outsourcing hub, and how has it developed those far? Those far? Does it work? Yeah. Okay. Hello, everyone, and uh, thank you very much for having me. Apologies for my voice. Uh, I got a bit cold, but I hope it will not affect what, what I have to say. First of all, I'm delighted to be in this panel, um, which is... Um, clear image of how successful women can be in Moldova, because I'm the only male representative here, so congratulations for that. Now, to your question, um, I think it's uh, a pretty long journey, at least for Moldova it's about five years, um, which was to a large extent uh, coming as the need to, of adaptation to the technological progress which is happening our, around us um, and especially happening with our clients. Um, the technological progress embracing 
different elements of technology by the clients is somehow pushing you to adapt and to develop operational models which would be corresponding to that um, and uh, would ensure the proper level of quality uh, and simultaneously a proper level of, uh, of engagement and uh, satisfaction from the team members. So basically, it's, it's, it's an important balance to, 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 to look at. And um, I think about five or six years ago, um, the concept which we have in the region and which Francesca was at that, point, at that time very much involved into, the Central Eastern uh, European Assurance Competency Center, which as we call it, um, it was scattered around a few locations in Poland, uh, North Macedonia and Russia. And the decision was taken to, to start piloting it in Moldova. Uh, the overall purpose is to make the processes, of course, the operational model, uh, op operational model standard across all the regions. It should be based on the same procedures and, of course, no, no specific approach to any service territory should be there. Um, and uh, a certain skill set development is, is also to be followed at, at a point in which you have uh, the necessary skills from one grade and above, you need to have them present, certain level of qualifications, and, and this is what was replicated here in Moldova as well, as in the other locations we have, we have in the region. Um, we started in 2019, I think it was 2019, uh, with 10 people from the beginning. It was more of a piloting exercise at that point in time. Now we are 50 plus. Uh, we plan to expand further. Uh, we are seeing the potential in the market. I mean, of course, we are feeling the pressure as everyone else in this room from the limited access to skilled labor force or the costs, the inflation, the costs which are growing. So basically, we need to correspond to that and adapt. But we see the potential. We are expanding. We plan to grow. Uh, we actually need a larger office, office space, which is actually connected to, to the topic of, the, to, of tomorrow's conference, right? Uh, how to ensure that the commercial real estate market is corresponding to this. So, um, yeah, and um, I think my last thought here would be that if we can do it, then it's possible. And it, it's a clear example that it can be done in this market, and we just need to find the, prop find the proper way to overcome those challenges which might be arising uh, in front of us. I guess that's my answer. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Alexander, for your uh, for insightful uh, and valuable insights, actually. Valuable insights. Uh, I would like to ask our next panelist, um, uh, Larisa Damova. Please, uh, could you share a success story um, related, we know that you're proud about, and we are also proud, uh, with the New York-based car service. We'd love to he hear about the challenges that you face uh, during this uh, partnership with them, and the strategy that uh, VITL employed, and the outcomes achieved in this particular collaboration. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I want just to dive deeper in this uh, success story. It uh, started in 2018 when a New York-based company faced a challenge on enhancing its customer service operation. So they are following uh, through evaluation of various outsourcing company, not only in Moldova, but they opted for the collaboration with uh, VTL. And you might ask why, Viatel. There is a free reason why. Uh, first, high English proficiency. So, Viatel call center operator uh, demonstrated a remarkable command of English language. This is a crucial factor for effective customer support. Also, testimonials from our existing clients. This is a telecommunication who is working in a telecommunication market, banking field, and not only. And uh, the fraud, uh, this is robust IT infrastructure. The objective of this collaboration was is to provide round clock uh, customer support for both existing and new clients. 
So what we achieved during this collaboration? Um, most uh, important fact that we built a call center from the ground up. So Journey Hour began uh, offering consulting services to help to organize this uh, customer support team. As uh, Partnership Hour progressed, Viatel gradually assumed responsibility for customer service workload. Next, uh, enhanced customer satisfaction. So we started to recruitment, training, and going staffing process in this way to ensure availability 20 of seven days uh, customer support team. The next will be improved safety and failover mechanism. So in address to challenge of network failover, Viatel uh, invested significantly in building resilient IT infrastructure. So recently we in order to ensure interrupted power supply during electricity outages, we installed the generator. Also, we invested to redundant service, data centers, and to failover mechanism that seamlessly switch to backup connection in event of network disruption. Today, we as a VTL plays a pivotal role in delivering customer service for this company across various service levels. Thank you, Mrs. Larissa, and we are really proud that the local company uh, uh, provided um, and services, uh, final services to uh, such a company, and that, as I know from inside, that they are extremely ha uh, happy with the level of the professionalism, level of English, and uh, all the things that you mentioned, and it makes us really proud. <laughs> Thank, yeah. you. Thank you. I would like to ask also Mrs. Uh, Melnichuk, Ms. Margarita, please share with us your success story of your company in Moldova and why Moldova? No, it's okay. Yeah, okay. Thank you for the invitation, of course. Uh, I'm with Pedersen Partners for 16 years and I saw the development of BPO sector from the very beginning until our days. And of course the sector and the company has a lot of ups and downs altogether, uh, but nevertheless we resist and we faced and many the situation during the crisis, pandemic, geopolitical situation and so on. So, long story short, Pedersen Partners opened the first office in uh, 2007 in Kishinau, and later in 2011 uh, we opened the second office in Belt. Uh, the first uh, service we provided from Moldova was of course a call center, and the single requirements we have for the candidates it was the English language. Now we are providing a list of services, processes, activities. So it's a finance, HR, IT, business development, finance. We have a great research center here. Uh, we permanently having up to 200 of employees, equal number of employees for Belts and Kishinau. We also offer um, opportunity to work uh, remotely for all our employees, which is very beneficial for the mothers with uh, small children, for people who are not based in Belts or Kishinau. So we are going into the regions um, as much as we can. Um, Moldova Center. Um, offers or support all Pedersen and Partners offices around the globe. There are 50 countries and we support all countries, not just the EMEA region. We also support Americas and IPAC regions and time zones, time differences, it's not a problem. We have dedicated people who are working for these time zones. And the fact that for the 16 years we continue to provide such services uh, means that everything working well. Uh, we're still developing and the list of services will be increasing and increasing permanently. Um, what I can see, uh, we of course a part of the IT park also and this is good that finally um, the government and uh, the ABSL uh, looking how to support and how to develop further this sector uh, in Moldova, how to help the companies, how to help the multinationals who are coming here. 
and to help all parties involved, actually, Moldova economy, multinational companies, foreign companies, and uh, the citizens who are living here and continue to work here. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Margarita. And I really uh, happy to hear uh, a concrete story about development in the region about um, really employing more and more knowledge intensive jobs because you are 16 year and you see really how it's changing now with the, after the digitalization, the art, uh, artificial intelligence. And it's, it's important uh, message to the public to understand that the business service sector, it's really extremely uh, knowledge intensive. Uh, with the big diversity in uh, gender, age, and diversity of professional career. And you are a real example, your, companies, uh, your company um, that proved this. Thank you. Thank you to, to be on this journey 16 years in Moldova and to be loyal to Moldova. I would like to offer the word to Daniela Vico. Uh, my, me personally, I am with the uh, uh, Essers company, collaborating with them more than 20 years. And the nice thing was actually what the previous speaker was uh, from other panel mentioned, that they came here as a transport company, as a uh, um, transport operator. And on, only after that, step by step, they were looking to Moldova as a sure service center. That was not their first um, first idea. And it's extremely important to approach, like uh, we were uh, advised before, the companies that are already in Moldova doing some other activities, industrial, logistic, transport, to also see with how they are dealing with this, uh, where they outsource, and to put uh, their attention uh, that that can be possible. Daniela, which are the main advantages for ESSERS in having the share service service operating from Moldova? Good afternoon, everybody. So thank you for the invitation, uh, Mrs. Lilia. Uh, so like Peterson and Partners, who have a big experience in Moldovan market already. We opened the office in Kishinev in 2008. Uh, so we are also having experience of more than 15 years of the market, and I have more than 10 years experience in business services. So I can speak about the business services for hours. But uh, today I will focus indeed I mean, on the advantages of having the shared servants um, in, uh, in Moldova. So first of all, what I would like to tell is the fact that as of last year, the shared service center from Kishinev is operating in a dual location concept. What does this mean? This means that we have the main service center in Kishinev, where we have a team of 100 employees, and we have the business continuity team located in Orada in Romania, where we have a team of around 30 employees. So an advantage or a must, taking into consideration the military conflict uh, in Ukraine, I would say we have a business continuity set up. So this means we can back up our core operations. Moving on, I can tell the fact that in our head office in Belgium, we being a transport organization, the organization is divided into transport business units. So we have the business units dedicated per type of transported goods. For example, we have the business unit transport pharma. Uh, also, we have chemicals, infra, and also, of course, we have in our head office uh, support units. So, within the shared service center, we do provide transport management services for all the transport business units in Belgium. So, this means that 90% of our activities are for transport. Um, pharmaceutical customers, so pharmaceutical transport business units represent our biggest internal customer with around 50 employees working for pharmaceutical goods, followed by chemicals goods, of course. And around 10% of our activities, they are mainly uh, focused for support uh, units from Belgium. Here we can mention finance and HR. So generally speaking, a lot of logistic services could be outsourced to Moldova, like you've mentioned. Indeed, they've been outsourced to Moldova. As a result, the team from Belgium could focus on the core business, transport, which is another advantage of, for any organization while you have a shared service center. In our shared service center, uh, the organization, they are centralized. So this means that our organization is divided per type of service. 
This gives the possibility for us to perform um, a big volume of work in less time, but also on a very standard uh, of quality level. By this, we are a partner of choice for our internal customers. And also moving on to another advantage, I would like to mention the fact that having your activities in the shared service center centralized give you the possibility to work on standardization and automation because today was mentioned a lot of time, uh, artificial intelligence, so on and so forth. But in this context, also I have to emphasize the fact that ESRS is a customer intimate organization. So this means that we still have a lot of exceptions per customers, which results in a huge amount of manual work from our side. So what we do this year, uh, we started the project of revising all our internal working instructions and we have them more than 1,000. Uh, of course, the goal is to make our working instructions as uniform as possible and standard as possible because it was mentioned automation, but if you want to automate, first you have to work on standardization of your processes, then you can automate and not vice versa. So we want to revising the working instructions. Of course, later on, we want to upload them in a document management tool, a central tool. But also one of the goals of this big project, because it's a huge amount of work, it's a project for months, uh, we want also to make an internal audit of all our processes. Because by revising your processes and looking with fresh eyes, only then you can find new ways for standardization and automation. And the last but not the least, I would say the most important advantage of having the shared service center in Moldova, uh, I would say the most important that made possible all the points I mentioned already, of course represents our team. Uh, you know, success is never a uh, one-man show. It's also a shared, um, it's a shared success. If you want to have success, you have to share it with a very nice team. So we have very nice, talented people working for YesRS uh, Moldova, and also I mean the team working for us, uh, for us in Oradea as well. They are the experts, they know their job, so this means that we are the owner of the services. We have monthly business review of our services with our internal customers, so we do analyze the volumes per type of service, also we do analyze the performance per type of service, per, um, per employee of course. This allows us to take proactive actions. For example, when we see volume decrease or increase, because as mentioned at the beginning, the market is changing. So of course, when the market is changing and we have less or more work in the organization, the head office, also we in the shared service center are impacted. And this allows us to take proactive actions when we see a decrease increase in volumes. By this, uh, we become a partner of choice with our internal customers and we have a collaboration based on trust and transparency. Thank you, thank you, Daniela. Thank you for you. As you saw, um, the sector is representing really various um, um, activity, consulting, finance, sales, telecommunication, transport. And uh, it's not only so diverse as uh, employment by gender, by age, by by profession, but activity, but we also see that we have here huge international names. In the same time, we have local uh, entrepreneurs that are very successful abroad. I am really positive about the mentioned thing by the Prime Minister about including diaspora. I think it's a real good uh, 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 option because uh, to start up a service center from investment point of view, it's not so difficult. And I think even for smaller companies, uh, like small entrepreneur initiative, this sector is extremely diverse. And uh, I think our panelists uh, uh, proved uh, you. And I want to uh, pass to our um, second part of the, um, of the panel and ask our um, uh, distinguished experts, why? Why do you think? this extremely diverse and uh, sometimes difficult to understand sector <laughs> for the large public. Uh, and I'm really uh, proud that we have today the first summit and I, will not, I, I would like to thank you all the partners, but it was already done. Uh, why this uh, sector uh, need to be supported? And I want to ask uh, Alexander, um, uh, 
from Pricewaterhouse. How do you perceive the connection between the IT park idea, which you helped to establish and execute, and the BPO industry support policies in Moldova? Well, that's even a longer journey than, uh, <laughs> than it was for the first question. I think it's exactly 10 years since the discussion about IT parks in Moldova. The first, very first discussion. This autumn, it will be 10 years. And um, back then, the uh, very assumptions which, which we took into consideration were so much different from what we have now. And um, I, I think the figures are speaking for themselves. I mean, it's, it's pretty relevant if we look at just some stats, if we look at the, at the um, number of uh, jobs created in the IT industry, 21,000 as of now. If we look at the BSS and doubling of the number of jobs in the past eight years, uh, revenues, we are going up to what five, six hundred million for IT, and what about two hundred million for BSS. Uh, and exports. My colleague Alina in in, in the morning presented uh, presented the slides which referred to the trade balance in terms of services. I mean, it's a positive trade balance, which is something to celebrate, I guess. And uh, when we speak about these figures, I, uh, it's kind of self-explanatory. Uh, you don't need necessarily to look into the details of it. As you say, it's potentially hard to understand. It's exactly as we are talking about AI these days. AI, I think no one is expert, actually, a real expert, because we don't know what the advance will be in the upcoming few years. Uh, and uh, I, I was at a panel uh, last week at the Three Cs Initiative in Bucharest, and it was a panel on AI, and we had, like, I don't know, seven, eight, largest IT tech companies in the world represented there. And it was a discussion about to which extent AI is going to impact. And I liked one, one, one opinion which, I mean, it, I can relate to. AI, uh, the technical skills of today are tomorrow's commodity. But at the same time, we never, well, at least so far, we don't see AI as something we can actually replace our, the need of technical skill fully. And just to check on that, how many of, uh, I'm curious how many of the audience have used AI tools of any forum, chat, GPT, or whatever else? Okay, not many then. But how many of you have felt that this is really replacing fully and not, doesn't require your involvement as a human factor to check on what's provided there? No one. Exactly, that's the message, including with the industry. Uh, we tend sometimes to look, uh, to live a bit in past in our understanding of the industries or of the uh, uh, mm, circumstances we are not connected directly to and perceiving some industries maybe not as they have evolved. So what was, I think, Olivia was, was, was referring to that. So when, when we talk about this, it's important to understand to which extent that's really contributing to our growth as a country, as an economy, and the figures are speaking for themselves. Now, what's important is to, um, to develop as much as possible those competitive advantages which was mentioned across the panels, right? We were talking about so many of those, about starting with time zones, going through the culture, skill set, about multi-language multi multi skill set. And um, uh, we should build up on that. Uh, and it's, it's good to hear that the governmental actions are somehow focused towards that endeavor to, to develop it. Of course, and here, um, making the connection to your question, actually, on how the IT park uh, concept is playing with this extension to the BSS industry. It's important to make sure it works in synergy. It's important to make sure that it's uh, it's building up as a, as a ecosystem, if you wish, which can actually be working together and not affecting another one. Because if we look just at the stats again, coming back to the presentation Alina Alina made, uh, we have this much 
five, four, four, four hundred, four thousand and something uh, IT IT uh, graduates from universities, and that much for BSS potential uh, uh, labor force for BSS. I mean, it's, let's not call it labor force; it's human capital, actually. So basically, when we talk about that, we can also try to build up synergies between these two, right? And that's something which clearly needs to be needs to be supported and helped by the state, by us as a community. And I'm glad that we have this first event, which is showing clearly how the stakeholders relevant from government, from public sector, um, um, and uh, private sector and, and, and practitioners are getting together in order to, to find those solutions. And it's clearly showing the need for that to happen. Now, within a certain dialogue and have it in a constructive way, I'm, I'm also representative, as you mentioned, I'm representative of AMCHAM Moldova, and uh, I'm not board member, but still EBA Moldova is, uh, uh, is, is in my heart. So uh, uh, we, we just need to, to make sure that works for everyone, but it's clearly need, support is needed, and there is a lot of potential there. Thank you. Member of ABSL Moldova. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Thank you. Thank you, Alexander. And uh, really, uh, if you're talking about artificial intelligence, uh, digitalization, it's my opinion, it's actually just a tool to have more knowledge intensive job <laughs> and just to use it, just uh, every uh, crisis uh, and every uh, tool it just can be used in order to be more efficient, better paid jobs and uh, more, like I mentioned, uh, knowledge intensive. But ab about this last point of better paid jobs, we are, think we are speaking about 36,000 average on yes. IT and what it was, 16 I think for BSS? And the gap is narrowing. I mean, it's clearly something which is so starting to get in, to get so far from the overall and so quick. economy. Yeah, and so quick. And the pace is is great. So that's clearly a sign of something to be supported and further on nurtured and developed. And even I want to mention that the BSS sector uh, offer a lot of educational and training program. Like it was mentioned, even uh, children after the high school they can be employed. And those education and training programs they are paid during these <laughs> training uh, and uh, um, uh, programs. And they are on such high international level that even if they want to work after that somewhere, an international company, they will have already those qualifications that they receive and they were paid to receive, <laughs> actually. That it's a great opportunity to, uh, to be, to be um, discovered, I think. Thank you, thank you, Alexander. I want to address uh, a little the same question to um, Mrs. Larissa. And um, we heard that the experts are telling this, if the BSS sector will be supported as, an, as the IT sector, the service export can grow in Moldova till 1 billion euro. Why, according to your opinion now, in the existing situation, is difficult to increase the sales, and especially because you are representing the um, company, uh, the local entrepreneur that actually sell his service. You are not a sure service center, and uh, for you the con the concurrence is even harder and um, even more difficult. Uh, and for you, it's extremely important, I think, to be competitive on the market in order to increase your sales. Yes, what uh, we want to point out that we have two crucial areas that need our attention. I mean, all our society, uh, from BCC, from BPO, from individuals, uh, in order to uh, invest uh, to education and professional training. Today I already talked about this uh, raised point, but I want to point out uh, again that uh, BPO sector relies on the workforce and these should be professional foreign languages. However, I would like to mention that we see that current quality of language education in school is not good enough. And for this, we need to take a proactive measures to improve at school education and make it more attractive to students. But what we see that this is not only help to gain a good language skill, they can succeed in the BPO center, 
sector, and in this way, Moldova might be a more attractive destination for international investors who are looking for qualified and multilingual workforce. To address these challenges, we, on behalf of BPO, we see that we need to collaborate with educational center to develop soft skills, technical competences that will be essential to succeed in the BPO sector. And this way, we see that we can uh, help to bridge the gap between academic knowledge and industry demand, ensuring that our workforce not only qualified, but also adaptable and ready to meet ever evolving needs of the sector. We are really enthusiastic about providing internship and on-the-job training, equipping our graduates with practical experience essential for their career. And the next, what we need should be uh, done in this sector, this is promoting the BPO sector as attractive uh, career option. So, uh, we already mentioned that we need to invest in education. But our industry offers a wide range of rewarding career opportunities from customer service, as you know, and till data analysis and so on. But however, we see that many young people not aware about the vast potential of this uh, uh, sector. That is why we see that we need to make some measures that help. And what it is, is conducting master classes, workshops, and informational initiatives um, that introduce students to this dynamic BPO world. For this, we see that we help uh, young people to see the sector as an attractive one. And uh, this is not um, only for personal growth students. This is help uh, to emphasize to our foreign investor that our um, Moldova's people um, has the cultural compatibility, language proficiency, and plus internet coverage, and it helps to see us as a serious business player on the BPO market. In conclusion, we see that if we will investing in the education, professional training, actively promoting BPO sector, and also with the help of our government, we can ensure that our industry can be uh, prospected and has a bright future. Thank you. Thank you, Larissa. And we have a lot of work to do. Uh, and uh, the most important that all the parts involved in this work are open to do this. And we have the platform to do this. And we have the first event. And I think now we need just to put some speed because the will is there, the opportunities are there, the support of our government uh, uh, and um, official institutions are there. And I've, I even was heard, uh, heard from the colleagues from the region how jealous in the way they are that our government is so supporting and so quick reacting. And it's, it's important to use, to use all those tools. And because of that, I want to, um, to address a message to the business service sector to join ABSL to make this voice uh, bigger and harder because we need every one of you, all the companies, the local one, from diaspora, from USA, from France, from Italy, from Spain, we have a lot of companies and please access our site, Abelsel Point them there, and please join the family. We need every one of you in order to make our voice bigger, to make more work groups, to do all those challenges also with the education that was mentioned, with the promotion of the sector. Uh, we, we need a, a bigger voice and we are really, really, really open to, um, uh, to see new members and um, to make the Basel family in Moldova bigger. Thank you, thank you. I would like to ask uh, Mrs. Margarita, what are the key ways in which the development of business service sector in the Republic of Moldova can positively impact our country and can be attractive location for multinational companies looking to establish uh, business process outsourcing operations in Moldova? 
good question. <laughs> As I mentioned, uh, all parties who are involved in this uh, process um, can be beneficiaries of this uh, synergy, let's say. Uh, Pedersen Partners used to be in the list of big taxpayers, for, and I know exactly the figures, how much we contribute for the Moldova budget. And probably if we make a kind of uh, analytics uh, contribution of foreign companies, BPO sector, IT sector to Moldova budget in forms of taxes, paid taxes, I think we will be impressed. And this is their first reason why government should look into this direction and make all possible and positive ways uh, to develop and to support such sectors. The second reason, um, of course, uh, job creation. The number of uh, working places we're creating, yes, it's enormous. Uh, multinational companies invest a lot in um, advanced technologies. And these advanced technologies are coming to Moldova and we just simply beneficiary of these technologies. And in the same time, um, the knowledge is shared with us. So people are becoming experienced in all these areas and they can use it for the future experience, can share with others. Uh, Pedersen Partners used to work um, intensively and collaborating permanently with all universities, uh, with occupancy agency, uh, proposing the partnership, proposing the internship, proposing the part-time jobs, the full-time jobs, uh, all kinds of uh, opportunities for the new people, for the young people to work and to stay in Moldova, to work for Moldova companies. Uh, so I think uh, the more uh, we will be doing, the, the more we will be developing here locally, uh, the more beneficials we will have, so all of us. Thank you, Margarita. Really, uh, everybody will benefit from this, as you mentioned. Everybody will be a winner. It will be a win-win for all the parties that, uh, that are involved. And being a part of a BSL family, we see in the region very clear that uh, beside in, in IT, for example, uh, about 30% of the jobs are created and about 70% are in the rest of the business service sector job. In our country, it's vice versa. We have 70% of IT jobs created now, at least the jobs that we see officially, <laughs> and 30% are in the um, business service sector. Why, Daniela, do you think that this sector, it's important to be supported? <laughs> so I think it's working, it's working. So it was mentioned already several times about the qualified people that you have in Moldova. So I am a believer of the huge potential that our people have. And I do consider uh, that we have really qualified uh, and high potential human talented people. Uh, human capital in, uh, in Moldova. And for any investor, believe me, from the experience that you have speaking with our investors, it's very important to have qualified people in your company. Um, a decade ago, again, from my experience, I will speak only from our experience that you have, indeed, Moldova was seen uh, like low labor cost. It's a true story, indeed. Nevertheless, what we see for the moment, the perception changed. And Moldova is also seen like a part of a huge European talented people. And it's very important, I mean, that by developing this sector, actually what we do, so we do also develop the economy of this country. It was mentioned that um, with the help of digital world, the diaspora can work for the companies in Moldova, being in Europe. I would say the vice versa, I think that by developing this sector, so we can motivate more students to stay in Moldova and to work for European companies, but being in Moldova. Like you know, we have a very uh, clear visibility of the IT sector on the market. But what is happening about the business services, we have the lack of visibility, but in the same time, we have lack of understanding of what business services are. So what we need to do, indeed, we need to promote and make this sector as visible as possible for everybody. And by this, indeed, we will promote and people will stay in Moldova and, of course, will attract also more investors. By this, also developing the economy of Moldova. So for me, the human capital, it's a potential 
and that's why we need to support the development of the industry of business services. That's first and the most important. And secondly, uh, of course, it's very important to have a friendly business environment uh, as well. From our experience, when we started our journey in 2008, of course, also we'll be looking for a partner to support. So for any investor, when you start uh, looking for options to open an office uh, in a foreign country, you need a partner. Within our company, we call this partnership in shared values, like liability and trust. And yes, in 2008, long time ago already, had the luck um, to find Luxali Consulting like a partner who helped to understand the local mentality, the mindset and the culture of people. Because the most important when you open an office in a foreign country is to understand how people think. It always starts with people and only with people. Also, all the bureaucratic process, the legal part from A to Z, the entire process was made by Luxali Consulting as well. And also the um, HR services, um, as well the account and sales services were outsourced from Luxali for many years. Of course, with the years, uh, organization in Moldova, I mean, ACERS Moldova was growing. That's why we took the HR part uh, in our side, so in-house, the HR, but uh, the legal services and the uh, accountancy services are still outsourced to Luxali Consulting, and they will be outsourced for Luxali Consulting, of course, from now on as well. And it's on, not only about legal part. We know that um, we have a partner on whom we can rely when we need any kind of help. For example, because was mentioned also that today is a big event, the Real Estate Forum. So yes, it's Moldova this year also relocated to a new office. So Luxali was helping us and to find a new office and also they helped us to organize the official opening of the new office. So it's very important to have the right partners when you start uh, a new business in a foreign country. This panel uh, is called Sharing Success Stories. What I would like to emphasize at the end is the fact that a success story is always a shared story. Thank you very much, Daniela. Thank you very much. And I want to uh, tell that all the qualities that you mentioned actually are qualities of the Moldavian people. And the same thing that you, had, you, you told about your team, about our collaboration, and we heard it also in our, in our other panelists uh, talking how impressed they are with the uh, motivated team, uh, how the, they were impressed with the qualification, um, also with their leadership spirit and everything. And, this is also an important thing to mention. The mentality and the will of the Moldavians uh, to develop their country, uh, to stay in the country, uh, but in the same time to have high qualified, well-paid jobs and be home near the dear ones. Thank you. Thank you, Daniela. Thank you, dear panelists. Thank you for your... Um, insightful information. Thank you to share your success story. And thank you to be with us. Thank you to be with ABSL family. And once again, I want to address, please join ABSL because we need every, every small company from five person to, I don't know, 500 person because we need this voice bigger. We need also the help to succeed, to work with the educational system, to change, to have your ideas, your proposals. And it's extremely important for us that the BSL family in Moldova is growing and we will be happy to embrace uh, new members. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dear Mrs. Sinchuk Engelin, we are also thankful for, for you chairing this uh, final panel. And we say thank you also to all of the panelists for their insights, for sharing their success stories here in Moldova on this market. I was also thinking about uh, some argument that came up to me, <clears throat> one of the discussions I had with our partners. And uh, it's also available for management consulting, for call centers, for legal services, for accounting, for audit. We are business services that not only consult advice, but also work for the clients. So we also do the job. <laughs> Sometimes it's the job that they don't want to do, and we do it for them, yeah? because we're good at that, because we have processes as well, because we're very organized. So this was the sharing of stories, successful stories, and I hope they inspired you like they did inspire me. 
to move on and to get more from the BSS sector. We have also at the forum some keynote speakers that I'm delighted to, uh, to present and to, to have here on the stage for you. And um, the first uh, international expert that uh, will come on this stage to, to talk about um, his experience and about the BSS sector. He has 30 years of experience in the sector, has opened more than 50 centers in BSS and also worked with, within more than 200 projects. So these are the statistics. Uh, I'm very delighted to invite here on the stage Mr. Romek Lubachevsky, sectoral expert and a renowned expert in the sector. Thank you. Please welcome him again with some applauses, support. It's on, you can hear me? Fantastic. Um, I need a table, sorry. Can I have a table? Can we have a table? All right, so let me first uh, tell you who I am, yeah, because I'm on the stage. Technical team. First of all, has anyone noticed that no one looks like their picture? I mean, I looked like that 30 years ago, I think. I, I definitely don't look like that now. Um, oh, yeah, fantastic, thank you. And a table? A table? Um, and Elias doesn't look like that either. Right, good news about Elias and bad news. I'll start with the bad news. He's not here. Uh, he was meant to be here last night. He didn't arrive. He was meant to be here this morning. He didn't arrive. And he was meant to be here now. And he's still not arrived. Good news is he's 10 minutes away. And, and why that is particularly good news is he prepared five slides that I have here. And I've been reading them for three hours trying to work out what the hell he's going on about, and I still don't know. So um, the great news is he's going to do his own slides, because uh, I was very worried you were going to ask me, oh, I was going to have to try and explain what it was that he thought was important. Right. So 30 years in business services, you're looking at me thinking, he can't be 30 years, I'm far too young. But really, 30 years. <laughs> uh, I led uh, the practice, consulting practice for, for BSS for, for PwC for ooh, 25 years. Um, I've done 200 global projects. I've been everywhere in the world, and I mean everywhere. Last week I was in Saudi Arabia. Don't go to Saudi Arabia on holiday, okay? That's the only thing I can tell you. It's not good for holidays. So the only thing I know anything at all about is this industry. I know nothing about, I'm a qualified accountant. Don't ask me to do your accounts. I don't know anything about accounting. I don't know anything about anything other than BSS. I am, I am an expert, I promise you. Um, we're going to talk about five things. Rather than tell you what they're going to be, I'm going to just jump in and let's go. Right, outlook of BSS. To, to a certain extent, what's written here, ignore it. Let me tell you the most important thing about BSS. Um, it is going to grow, okay? That's what we care about. It's going to grow bigger and bigger. Of that, I am absolutely certain. If I can want you on a statistic, I will hazard a guess at 25 to 30% growth over the next three years. Why is that important? Well, that gives Moldova an opportunity, obviously. If it was shrinking, it's a smaller opportunity. It's growing, it's a bigger opportunity. Now, what I think is super important is to get an understanding of where the growth comes from. Now, most people think the growth foreseen into the future is gonna come from new centers. Uh, I, I come from Krakow. Uh, I, 28 years ago, I opened the very first center in Krakow with five people, there was five people. There are now 75 to 85,000 people in that industry, okay? And when you talk about growth in Krakow, the growth in Krakow of around 10%, 9.5% is from growth in centres that already exist. There will be two or three new centres, there will be 50 to 100 people, that's it. All the growth will come in a mature market comes from growth from within the centres that already exist. So that's growth type number one. Growth type number two, as I already mentioned it, it's new centres. Now they will come. 
Okay, they will come, don't worry, they are coming. Will they go to Krakow? Some, not so many. Okay, so this is an opportunity for Moldova because there's new centers coming. I think that's a tough market though. I always like to put myself in the shoes of a potential investor. So let's pretend I'm PepsiCo because I work for PepsiCo. I'm PepsiCo, I'm setting up a GBS. Would I in Europe open my first and only center in Europe in Moldova? Answer, no. Okay, and it's really simple why. You're not mature enough. You don't have the capability for me to hire 500 people in the next year. So it's not an, anything against you. It's just you're not mature enough yet. So new centres, if you're going to get new centres, they're going to be companies not well known and quite small. It doesn't matter. Centre is a centre. Heads are heads. FTEs is FTEs and growth is growth. The third element of growth, which is where I think Moldova actually has its best opportunity, is from centres that exist that are too big. So I'll give you an example. State Street in Krakow, two and a half thousand people. Five years ago, opened a second centre, second centre. They didn't close the first one down. They then put a thousand more people in Gdańsk. Credit Suisse, four and a half thousand people in Wrocław, put a thousand people in Warsaw. PwC Romania put up 50 people into Moldova. Okay? Now, why I think this is a great opportunity for Moldova is there are many centres which are too big. Many centres are feeling the pain and they are going to start looking for a second location. And for me, if they're in Europe, they will stay in Europe. They are not going to India. They are going to come here. Question is where? So I think this is a magic opportunity for you guys. So think about that. It's not about finding the new client, new client. It's the ones that are already there, just not here. Okay? Again, the other area I think personally when I look at an outlook going forward is when I think about outsourcers. I used to be an outsourcer. It's a, it's a different business to running a, a centre itself. It just is because you have clients rather than working for yourself is the big difference. But listen to this. In the world of outsourcing, I would guess 30 to 40% of all contracts, all contracts in CEE are up in the next three or four years. This is billions of dollars of work by 50 very large outsourcers are all having their contracts renewed, meaning clients are saying, I like you, Accenture, I like you, IBM, I like you, I like you, I like you, but to keep liking you, show me the money. Literally, show me something. Either do it better, faster, but cheap is the big word, trust me. And then I think, so what do outsourcers do? They either have to get really, really smart, lose money, or find another location, which is cheaper than where they are right now, okay? And it's not India, because they're all in India, so it's not an India thing. So again, within Europe, within CEE, this gives you a competitive advantage. So the two areas I would think you should be looking at is outsourcers and second centres or third centres for companies already in, in this market, meaning Central and Eastern Europe. Big is beautiful, lovely. Low cost, right. Everyone says this, everyone comes on stage, it's not about cost, it's not about cost, right? What a load of bullshit, right? Of course it's about cost. No, no, I'm going to take my 50 people from New York and move them somewhere more expensive. Oh, yeah, that happens all the time, right? No, it has to be cheaper, otherwise why would they move it? Come on, right? So it isn't only about cost. I have a lovely way of explaining this. If it's fantastic people and they're cheaper, that's better than cheaper or fantastic people. Both. So what I'm looking for are fantastic people at a lower price point. Ring sound like something maybe Moldovan? Sounds like that to me. So again, another area where I think you guys have an, a competitive advantage. You've got great people, it's not too competitive, and you're at a price point which is very competitive to the rest of CEE. Brilliant. Trapped talent. Okay, my favorite one. I opened this center in 1996 in Kakov with five people and my boss said, the market's looking very hot. I hired five people. 
One year later, it's very hot. And every year for 25 years, someone said to me, Cuckle, very hot. And of course, every place, every place, you win a big contract, someone extends, the demand on the marketplace goes up, the number of people available, it's called demand and supply. But I have to tell you this, it has never, ever been, I've never come across a location that said, you can't come. I have no people available. What a load of rubbish, right? You can always find more people. You may have to pay them a little bit more. You may have to look a little harder. So, trapped by talent, I don't, never worries me. So this isn't a problem you will face. The speed of growth, you can't go from 100 to 10,000. I get it. But you can go from 100 to 1,000 to 3,000 to 10,000. That's realistic. And that's what you will do. So growth is super important. Okay, AI. Uh, the team talked about it a little bit before. Um, right, I always like to look back in time and then go forward. The trend is my friend. Right, you don't really, like, this will show my age. I remember uh, a piece of software coming out called OCR, Optical Character Recognition, about 25 years ago, and they said, this is going to kill the outsourcing industry. Okay, we're still here. They said, you'll never have another piece of paper in your office. Yeah, right. I, everyone has paper all over their office. Then the next one, eight years ago, robots, robots. Oh, my God, it's going to kill our industry. We're going to die. McKinsey, one of the, I would say, premium, the premium strategic advisor in the whole world. I listened to them, except that day, when the guy stood on stage and said, robotics are going to kill 45% of the jobs in outsourcing. 2018, he said this. Since then, we have grown 45%. Yeah? Smart guy. He said we would shrink, we've grown. So what a load of rubbish. Okay? And then you go, AI. AI is going to kill our industry. Bullshit, guys. It is not, right? The way, again, stand back from this. You're, we were PepsiCo boss before. Now you have to be Coca-Cola. I want to make sure we get all the brands so no one says I'm favoritizing one cola brand. Your Coca-Cola boss of whatever the boss does, and your boss says to you, listen, I want you to set up an AI team of about 300 people around the world, and you're the boss. Now tell me, hands up, how many of you said, do you know what, I think we should put two AI guys in 150 different offices around the world, or who thinks we should do three offices with 100 people in each of the offices, which is the right approach? You still have 300 people in AI, but you have them spread around the whole world, one or twos, or do you put them and group them together? Right, no one's hand has gone up, which is a little bit worrying. The answer is two, meaning less is beautiful here. So put them all in one place. Why? Because you have more people, they train off each other, they develop off each other. One guy leaves, I don't care. Imagine if you're in an office with two people and one of them leaves. Do you know what happens? The other one leaves. That's exactly what happens, right? And so suddenly in New York, you have no one with AI. There's if I have 100 people here and one leaves, I don't care, I hire another one. And do you know, people want to work there because there's 99 people and it's a one of the best AI places in this part of the world, maybe in the world, right? What a great thing. So what would I say to you is, our industry is going to thrive from this, not die. But, and this is the trick, if you open a centre, he's coming? I thought you were telling me to walk more. No, no. She went like this. <laughs> um, I've lost my train of thought. Where was I? If I opened a centre, are you sure that was where I was? If I opened a centre, but... Ah, right. So this is growth for us because if I was opening a centre, do you know what I would do? I train every person in my centre. I don't care what they do. HR, I don't care if they're finance. I don't, maybe the cleaner, no, but even the cleaning lady or man, I would train them on the basics of robotics and AI. Why? Because these are the people you're going to use to develop because there's a question that comes in is... In this city right now, are there 1,000 AI experts? Answer, no. Right? So do you buy them or do you build them? The answer is you build them. And who's going to do it? You are. 
So in the center that exists, take good people who interest them. I, oh, I love robots, it's my hobby. Hey, come and join our internal team and I'll put you through loads of training. And when the client, next client turns up and says, hey, we need AI, I've got three guys already sitting there, no more than everyone else in the building. So you've got now to think about, you can't just wait for the work to come. Be the first to go, I've got a team. I've got eight people. Who else has got eight? No one. Thank you very much. I'll go from eight to 18 to 58. Give me two years and you get the work. So that's the way I think you've got to approach this. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you very much, ABSO, for getting me here just in time. <laughs> Just their time to shut me up. Yeah, yeah. Good man, good. We know, we've known each other 20 years and we've been on the stage 20 times together probably, yeah? Abso absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So absolutely. We're, we're a team. You can't get him without me. It's a free <laughs> gift, the gift. Okay, I'm going to just run. You interrupt please, when you're ready. Please. Okay, trends and challenges. Work from home, COVID. Everyone was in the office. Everyone was in the office. Suddenly everyone was at home. If you read from 100 of the world's top companies, I'd say 50 of them right now are saying, I want you to come back to work. What they're not doing very well is saying one day, two days, every day. They're not doing very well at this, but some have said it. I think Google said, everyone back every day. T Tesla said, everyone, every, I can't remember, but some of the big companies have said, you're coming back, it's not a choice. But in our industry, unfortunately, because we've let everyone go home, we're finding it hard to get pull them back in. Um, and I would say, if you talk to 100 centre managers in, in a mature market, what is the one thing that they're worried about medium to long term? It's about getting their staff back in the office. Okay? I don't think we have that big problem at the moment, but it is a problem we will face. If I could give you a tip here, if someone in an interview said, do I have to work every day in the office? And I say yes, and they go, mm, I wouldn't hire them. I put, that's the way I, I would be. If I run a centre, you come in, you, you can have one day off, a, you know, you don't have to come in five, but I don't want to hear I'm not coming in. No, I don't want to, you don't work here. I, I think we have to be that brutal in this space. The reason being is you will lose competitive advantage to your competitors across the road. They will take all your people that say they don't want to work, and their efficiency will go in the toilet, there will be a rubbish centre, and you will be a great centre, with everyone sitting there, happy. Yeah? I'm telling you, that's got, you've got to be tough. You've got to be tough in this one. Link to digital transformation. This goes a little bit back to the AI thing, but I have to say one thing I've noted, which, which makes me feel great, is more and more clients I've worked on on the last two or three years, what we're seeing is large-scale system implementation, things like SAP, SAP for HANA, um, Oracle, and big, big platform changes. What used to happen is it used to happen somewhere and then the, the centre used to get the end product. What we're seeing now is it's happening in the centre. The centre drives the implementation, which is, again, fantastic news, because it's not just the job of the people sitting there, but you hire five more people or ten more people to help implement this over three or four years. More work for the centre. So the centre is seen as the hub of activity. All the good stuff going on is in the hub, not in each of the offices. Again, system implementation in 20 countries, you want 20 teams or one central one? Yeah, it is really that basic, and, and I'm seeing that more and more, and I love it. Virtual customer experience. This goes to a little bit thing of like, honestly, chatbots, etc. Will, will this take work away? Yes. Who will write the chatbot? We will. Who will manage it? We will. Who will administer it? We will. Who will write the next one? We will. Yeah, so the center's doing all of this, writing it and maintaining it. It will lose some work because there's less phone calls. But the reality is in totality, in the whole business, there's more work, trust me. Rarely one centre more global model, I think we all know that, that if it, but if I look at trends and challenges, I'd say that a little bit of the trend, and I'm hoping this will continue, is centres are now feeling they're too big, and I do see that step to have a secondary centre, particularly in Central and Eastern Europe. New processes. 
this one's quite quite good. If you if you think about it, the most common ones are IT, finance, HR. They're the big three. But now we're seeing lots and lots of marketing, uh, marketing, legal, yeah, uh, lots and lots of different little things that before you would thought COVID has created this and is brilliant. COVID came along. And those seven people in New York and six people in London who they said they have to be in London and New York, they have to, because they have to be in the office, didn't go to the office for six months. And suddenly someone went, oh, wait a minute. If they don't have to be in the New York office, why are they in New York? Why aren't they in here? That's exactly what happened. So more and more of this work, they've all discovered that it's all bullshit for years. Hi, Jim has to be in New York office. Well, he didn't come in for six months. Proof you don't need to be in the New York. So this, for me, that new process is a lot of it's being driven by COVID. And it, again, it brings more work, more work to us. There's no line, in my personal view, everything is possible. The other way I look at this is if I can document the process, and I can, if I, you show me your, what you do, I will document it. I can train Elias to do it, and he will do it. 90% of the whole back office of every company we can do 90. So the scope here is massive. There's loads of work coming. Loads of work coming. Okay? BPO versus BSS. I don't think they're directly in competition. I can tell you 20 years ago, 15 and 10 years ago, is a much more competitive market. Um, we did fight each other for talent. We don't so much anymore. It's, it seems to be... The BPO drive forward is much more about people going in, into like a university school, working for a year and a half, and then going work in the, in the centre. That seems to be what commonly happens. And I'm quite happy with that. They can do all the training and then I steal them. Um, but I do think that I see centres growing. So I, I see this growth coming out of that. And outsourcing in the total global market, I see as flat. I don't think in totality they're going to grow. I think where they will grow is in cheaper locations with talent. So the Krakow outsourcers are going to get smaller and they're moving the walk somewhere and the work I hope is moving here. GBS versus shared services. This is where we go to the, do you call it BSS, BBS, shared services, shared delivery center, centers of excellence. Keep going, keep going. I don't care what you call it. Do you know what it is? It's a group of people in a room working. Okay? It is that. Um, there is a difference, though, where lots of clients, lots of customers want to be GBS because shared services sounds old. GBS sounds cool. There is an element of that. But the biggest change, which you can see in the, in the more mature market, for 100% for sure, is that within GBS, what the movement is, is the leader of the people runs the process, not the center. Okay. Let me say that again. So it used to be, oh, when I was a centre manager, I was God. I, I say this, it happens. Pay rises, free cars. And okay, I never gave a free car. But whatever I said was like, that was it. Yeah? All 500 people, they all work for me. Nowadays, it doesn't quite work that way. And it's definitely moving this way. So what happens is the centre manager is in more in charge of making sure the office is there, there's electricity, there are people working there, we're hiring them, we've got finance people, we've got recruiters, and et cetera. And the people doing the process are led by someone who globally leads the process. And they can sit in the center, often they don't. Often they don't. So your boss can be anywhere in the world. That is definitely a move, it's very slow. So industry growth or decline, definite growth. Cool? Anything I haven't said or you would like to add? There is a question I had for you as you talk about um, work being less tied. You gave the New York example, and we both have a friend in purchase <laughs> who just won a big prize for one of the top 20 GBSs globally. And indeed, the work got transferred to remote, to the Jersey side. And to your point, center size is big, beautiful. Um, don't ask my wife, she'll tell you something you don't want to hear. <laughs> but I'm, I'm just thinking of our friend who started off with an organization of 2,500 people globally in five centers of each among 500 people. 
And he says, I want to have fewer and bigger. Well, he was 2,500, now he's like 13,000 people globally, but he spread into seven centers. And I, I think one thing that is important for countries like Moldova, and we got Pavel Panche here, my good friend, uh, I mean, average center size indeed, if you take Poland, it's, it's like 300. I don't give a hoot, because averages, if you look back, in 2003, most centers that came in had 250 employees, but they have grown. And so what you see today in mature markets is that the, the average is still there, but there's some huge monolithic centers, and so many other companies continue to do the very first move. So the average being more or less the same as 10 years ago is due to the fact that there are many more new entrants. But I put it to you that even with remote yes or no, there are more large centers today, 1,000 plus, than we've ever seen. I mean, it's not that that got killed through COVID, did it? No. no. <laughs> he said no. <laughs> I said no. There's more centers. There's no, I, really, there is no doubt we're in growth, no doubt, as an industry. But I think where the growth is, is going to change a little bit. That's why I think there's a great opportunity here, right. personally. But we're going to talk about locations more specifically. I'm going to move on to my last slide and then you're off, my friend. Um, right, governance is changing. Um, I said this already about GBS and shared services, blah, 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 don't care to a certain extent. It's not all about price and cost. I said this already. So I'm repeating myself so that I make my point. If someone says it's not about money, rubbish, but, but, and this is, the, I think, the one which is so, so important. It's about a talent pool, okay? So if, if I come here and I'm looking to open a centre, I know what the price is because I've checked pricing out. Now you need to convince me that I can get to 500 people over the next five years, okay? So I need to see that there are people at the universities, that they're learning the right things, they have a good work ethic, all of these things we need to see it, and I need to believe that as fast as I grow, you will pump the pipeline. So I personally think it's more about, it's all about the people. That's really clever, I wonder who wrote that. It's all about the people at the end of the day. People, 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 okay? And this is the other thing. There's a complete misconception in our industry is that when you do finance and accounting, that makes you an accountant and you studied economics or finance or, fin or something, yeah? Well, no, not true. I've had people who studied farming and we, we literally had someone who studied nuclear fission working in accounts payable, right? When you think about the work in the center, the only thing I look for is smart. And I don't mean smart what you know, but what you can know, your ability to learn. Your ability to learn is what I'm looking for. Why? Because you've never processed an invoice, you've never done a payroll, you've never collected cash. I will show you how to do it. Can you do it? And yes, you can because you're smart. So when you think about people, it's that ability to learn these processes. These processes are not super difficult. Again, that makes you think that this is a crap job because it's crappy work, it's really simple. But if you're good at it, within two years you're a team leader, you're managing 10 people at the age of 25. At the age of 28, you're running four teams, 45 people. At the age of 35, you're running a contract of 150 people worth $12 million a year. You get me? That's, the, that's where, you, where you can keep yourself happy. You learn the process and maybe I change you and move you to a different process because you're so good at that, I know you can learn that. The ability to learn is what we're looking for. That talent pool is that. Not just size, but the skill, willingness to adapt, all of those other things. Inflation, someone put some inflation numbers up. Good news is everyone has this pain. Okay? So it's not like inflation is going to ruin the business here because in Poland we have 10% inflation as well. So, and the whole industry is experiencing high inflation. Every country slightly different. But the reality is, often it goes arm in arm in time with the currency. So often the currency saves you a bit with high inflation. So in other words, you might put your salaries up 10%, but 
but simultaneously your currency has fallen three, so the net net is seven, and maybe the currency drops off a little bit more later in time. Keynesian theory says it will. Mm. But inflation is hitting everyone, so it's not like you're going to be the only people. In the UK, inflation is high. In France, it's high. In Italy, it's high. So they have inflation on a higher number. If I cost 100 and I have 5% inflation, and, and another guy, Elias, has 50 and has 8% inflation, who actually costs more now? Still me, and the inflation amount is higher than the increase on Elias. So net-net, it's smaller. Think of that. So inflation hurts, but it's hurting everyone. I, I absolutely agree. I absolutely agree. And I'm going to ask you some questions. How does this work? Oh, Your next slide green. is you. All right. Um, so we often end up in debates, does location still matter? Like, and somewhere you have painted a picture where it is about digital, um, where remote exists. And um, I used to work for his competitor, Deloitte, and their shared services team, their guru, for 20 years said, Elias, digital is going to put you out of business. Well, I'm still here, I'm still standing, and we're still rocking on location. But their location, in order to have that conversation with your boards, your shareholders, with prospective investors, a couple of things. So, downward pressure. I think that there's a good sign here because COVID, the deglobalization, and even, I call them the fanatic and the Kremlin, we all know who I'm talking about, but it's leading to a less, the global village is gone. It has been crumbling, the good years are over, okay? I was born in the 60s, I got the 70s, got the 80s, started working in the 1990s. As of 2012, the world is deglobalizing. Now, is that bad? No, because it forces companies to vertically diversify within one region, right? And of course, there will always be India, there will always be lower cost locations, but indeed, expect a future where centers in, where Europe will need more of its own centers and it will be less outsourced to the other side of the world because of resilience accelerated by COVID, because of deglobalization going on. And now we've got the united regime of North Korea and Russia coming up on stage. I wonder what that's going to spell for us. But anyway, resetting remote, and you spoke about that. And you and I share the same vision, but I had this conversation with a, a, a lady in Krakow. Uh, it's actually American Express. And she mounted her center in HR services during COVID on a complete remote basis. So it can be done. And she taught me one thing. And she said, Elias, at the start of COVID, people were first forced into remote, not out of free will. But now, now that they learned the trick, they want, some of them want to still have remote because they want it. And not every company strikes the right balance. Companies are still struggling on that. So there is that new realization, remote in one way or the other, is going to be part of how people work and how centers will be run. Does location still matter? Well, location criteria, it's the, the, the top three, we all know it, talent, talent, talent. Talent is not very mobile. This is not the United States of America. People don't move around Europe as much as they move around, uh, say, the United States. Talent gets clustered into cities that's our history, that's the way we are. It's our species. That is where the universities are, where there are nice housing options. Where that's where the people you want to hang out with actually live. So McKinsey did research on that at the start of the COVID just to find that in Europe, around 50 cities are responsible for 12% of European GDP. So the cities will be there. Talent, talent, talent. So you want the talent, you've got to go to the cities. I mean. I remember when the project, I think you and I kind of met, but we didn't, back in 1993, Krakow was marketing itself the city you love to live in. That's before they had the little smog problem, of course. But think of it, the city you love to live in, quality of life. That brings me to newer location criteria. It's still about talent, talent, talent. But what my clients are asking me about now is 
Can you guess? Resilience. Resilience. Resilience of public transport, of electricity, of how local governments and national governments re react to a crisis. Think like COVID. So they are looking for that. They are also really looking very much for ESG, a key topic at the uh, ABSL Poland the conference in Krakow not that long ago, last week. ESG matters to companies because their clients rate them, their employees rate them, and the government controls them. ESG gets expressed into what type of building, who do I work with, what is the governance. Uh, there have been questions some of my clients ask, can I go to this or that country because they seem to be very anti-free speech. And they would, didn't go to Hungary because they're a media company, they don't want to be associated with the media policies of the current president of the Hungarian Republic. So ESG is a second new development. The last new development, and that really has to do with COVID, is more attention for micro-location. The accessibility, the quality of the office, how the office is. My clients are spending more time on these three questions than, let's say, five years ago. Location. Reshoring Bonanza. I, I mean, how many of you are excited about all the jobs coming back to us from India? Hands up, please. Okay. <laughs> you know where I'm going, Pavel. Forget about it. It's not the jobs that are coming back. The work is coming back. Because, and I had this conversation initially in Poland, and not with Pavel, he's too smart for that. But... Uh, in the wake of COVID, I had these Central European politicians say, oh, oh, the Indians are jobs are coming back. And I had a mayor of a city, indeed, in Poland say, the jobs are coming back. I said, the jobs are coming back, Elias, are you deaf? I said, yes, I'm deaf a little bit. And I said, explain to me how many Polish people I will find that will spend their day coding expenses for a monthly wage of 550 euro. Oh, we don't do that, we're Polish, we're educated. My point exactly. You're educated, you will develop the software, that job is not coming back. Everything that we outsourced and offshored, whether it's in manufacturing or on our sector, it ain't coming back in terms of jobs. It will come back in type of work, but think of it. The Indians work at a fraction of the salaries that we want here in Moldova, in Poland, in Belgium where I live. Um, we will not have the workforce. So forget about it, it's not gonna happen. You still agree with me? Good, good guy, good guy. Right, footprint changes. Let's look at some facts. Now, I love history because it never ceases to amaze me how predictable it makes the future. So what we've got here are statistics from the Financial Times as statistics about companies that announce that jobs will be created in shared services, R&D, uh, IT, um, and global business services, technical centers. And it's the job creation on an annual basis from 2003 to 2021. It focuses on the, um, how do we call it? The outsourcing countries of Europe. And I'm, by Europe, I mean Europe. I do not mean the European Union. I mean the real Europe. And so what have we seen that throughout this period in the outsourcing countries, I'll get back to that definition, we see that through the years, indeed, I mean, here we had the 2008 financial crisis. Well, our sector didn't lose much sleep. It got back. Of course, it got hit by COVID. It came back with a vengeance. So I think that if you look at it, does location still matter? Well, look at it continuously over that period, if you add it all up, around 550,000 jobs were created in the wider European theater in the area of business services. So hooray for us. <laughs> then, if you look at the numbers of jobs created per country, this is Poland. That's Moldova. 
size does matter. It does matter. So you got to compare with comparables. I get to that in a second, but, and I had that conversation with Igor on the way in. So this country had a population of around 4.8 million a couple of years back, and now it's down to 2.3 million. Don't compare yourself with Poland. There's too many of them. Go for your comparables. But let's get to that in a second. So if history is a lesson, the sector is still doing great. The sector is still creating a lot of jobs. And maybe you didn't get your fair share. OK, job creation share. Now, let's look at that. So the red line is what I call the Balkans. And forgive me for being so Dutch and theoretical, but if Romania is considered part of the Balkans, I thought that let's make it easy and include Moldova in the Balkans as well. So what do we see? The market share of, uh, say, uh, Eastern Europe. Eastern Europe is everything that is east of here, east of your border with Ukraine. We see the market share going down. We're talking about, in the good old days, when they were still nice guys, Russia wasn't a bad place. We all know about the IT miracle that happened in Ukraine, right? We know that Kazakhstan, Georgia, and others have been making inroads. Still, over the last 22 years or 20 years, their market share has gone down. We see, actually, let's cut through the chase. This is what happens with Moldova, Romania, Bulgaria, um, and the, the western part of the Balkans. So a market share that hovers around 20% every year, which isn't bad. What is also important to note is this guy here. South West Europe. Spain, and particularly Portugal, are changing the game. And they have been changing the game since around 10 years. There were countries where I would never take any of my clients to. Today, I cannot be taken seriously if my team does ignores to look at Portugal. They're making a killer on cost and on quality, mainly of talent. Okay? So, so that's a competition field for you. We looked at the Balkan cities. And it starts with Bucharest, sizing and plays. And we have Chisinau, very modest. Now, that number, ABSL Moldova will contest, and I'm with you on that. But that's what the Financial Times tracks down. So all the numbers are wrong. But by order of magnitude, indeed, Chisinau, I, I mean, look, look at it. How can it be that Skopje or Krajowa has more jobs than you? It's not you're doing a bad job. It means there's still potential to grow. And that is, I think, brings me to the last question that was put to, to us. Um, what does Moldova need to become a Fulbright BPO nearshoring destination? Well, I'm a consultant. And let me tell you a little secret. It's better to steal a good idea than to invent a, invent a bad one. Okay. And probably that what wasn't applicable to your big blue consultancy, but that's the hard way I learned it. Um, so I, I, I think that when you tr look at the future, look at comparables. And it, it's, it's what I said before. Your population is almost that of Lithuania. Lithuania was not in this game 10 years ago. No, 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 no. They had like six, 7,000 people working in the sector. Today, I think they just tipped 20,000. So it accelerates. Success breeds success. I think what you want to do is, the easy way is indeed, go to Lithuania. Ask them for their ideas. The reason why the Czech Republic was very successful, true story according to the Hungarian Investment Promotion Agency, is because the Czechs a long time ago went to Budapest and said, what is shared services? How should we attract it? Well, the Czechs certainly didn't waste any time taking in the lessons and indeed creating a sector of around 75, 78,000 people to date. So indeed, think of other, what other smaller countries are doing, what their success stories are. It is indeed about talent development. It is indeed about being in the game. You've got to be visible. If you want to win contracts with companies to attract their outsourcing business, whether you're a government or whether you're a private sector, you cannot do it by staying right here. You need to be in those trade shows, in those business meetings all the time. You've got to be in the game in order to win the game. 
The rest of the recipe is a, a fairly easy one, of course. It, it is about education. It is about um, having incentives available. Though the smart people I work with, they say, Elias, want to see my incentives? And they take me to a university. So that is your incentives. It's the talent. It's not about the money. On incentives, cash, we site selectors, we say, incentives are like peanuts. If you give peanuts, you get monkeys mm -hmm. and monkey business. Mm -hmm. So don't put too much money into a project unless there's a real job creation factor that makes it worth your while. Now, if we spoke about the outsourcing destinations of Europe, the world is bigger. We spoke about a friend of ours. Uh, in order to expand his operations in Central Europe, he's actually adding a workforce of 1,000 people in Cairo, expanding Europe in Egypt. It happens. We have Georgia. We have Morocco, Tunisia. Even Uzbekistan is trying to get its share of the cake. So even though you're Europe, even though there is a de-globalization going on, the competition is really out there. Can, can I jump in, Elias? I, I, I'd like to share a really important point. You made it, but I like repeating, is without a doubt in the last five years, without a doubt, the best agency for, for getting BSS in is Lithuanian, investing in Lithuania. They are, they're not good, they are miles above the whole world. They are fantastic. And he knows them all. Pavo knows them all. So I, I, I would say, there's one thing I would do, is go and talk to them. They're great people. They won't think you're going to take any work. <laughs> so learn from them, steal from them, and succeed based on that. Because I, I, why, why invent an approach when they are brilliant, and they are brilliant? We're not in Lithuania today. No, no, no. Okay, a last thing, and Romek was so happy to see me here because he didn't know what to say to this yeah. slide. I don't know who that is, so does anyone know who that is? Hands up, anyone, come on. Who is it? It's not Elias, is it your dad? No. So, so this dude, my dear friend, is Jack Welsh. Welsh, yeah, okay, I thought it might be. Yeah. Jack Welsh, former CEO of uh, General Motors. Uh, no, General, General Electric. Electric. Absolutely. And he would say, lead, follow, get out of the way. So everything that we've said and that I just came to illustrate on, on what you business people, but also government people and ABSL in Moldova can do, you could get out of the way. I don't recommend you do that because you haven't achieved your fair share yet. So you've got to be in the game. Are you going to lead it? Forgive me my French, Matt, but you're not ready for it. But you're a young organization, you're a relatively new player in the game, so you're not going to need it. That brings us to actually, and you, you already niched my final line. Copy. Yeah. Copy from Invest Lithuania, copy from the other ABSLs that you have. Some are extraordinarily good, others I'm not sure whether they are good of guidance. But indeed, copy for the time being, you can grow, you got the talent, your costs are okay. I, am, I do not care that much about costs. Um, geopolitical challenges, okay, they have been around. When I located my first center in Krakow, it was 1993, which is four years after the wall came down. Mm -hmm. My client was a big oil company, and you know them well because you did a lot of work for them. Um, they weren't worried. Poland was not a member of NATO. It had not yet applied for EU membership, if my memory serves me right, and yet, the client decided to put critical finance processes into Krakow. So if somebody says, oh, we've got problems with geopolitics, well, let them stay in their cave. Many businesses will understand that risk entails reward. So that on a closing point. Any questions for Romek or myself? Actually, I'm gonna, I, um, before we go to the floor, I have four, four key points, messages I want to uh, give. Because I've been here all day, so I've listened to what other people people have said and I've taken it on board. Um, so I wanted to just make four, four points. One is, this is a fantastic industry to work in. I think we're forgetting this. It is really a magic environment. You have all age groups, you have people from all around the world, you have 
20-year-olds and 50-year-olds. You have people who have children who want to work nine to five and leave and not work at the weekend and not do overtime. And it is a fantastic job for them. It is a fantastic job when you're 23 and you think you can rule the world. You have the opportunity. It doesn't mean you will take it and succeed. But in these centres, the opportunity to go forward is massive. It is such a great... The offices are always the best in town. Always. They're amazing, the physical offices. PwC's largest office is in Katowice. It's a delivery centre, so it's not a PwC office as we would know it. And it is the best centre, probably best office in Europe for PwC, the nicest. It is class A, A, A. It is beautiful. And we have a delivery centre in there. So it, 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 don't think about call centres and, and crappy work. This is great work in a great environment with coffee, with good health care, in a great environment of people roughly your age with a common way of working and thinking. It's great. Don't ever forget that, that this is a great industry. It's not a crap one at all. To that point, my second is, we, I've heard too many times today call centre and ITO. I don't want to hear that. We call it all one, BSS or BPO or GBS, don't care, but call it commonly all in one group. And I'll tell you why. In, if you take the four, three, four largest markets in CE, which would be Poland, Czech and Hungary, just take them, they've been going for 25 years. So they're where we're going. Moldova will get there in 20 years, 15 maybe. We're going there. Think of this statistic. The amount of IT and call centre work is probably 30%, max, max which means 70% is not. It's not IT work and it's not call centre work. It's all the other stuff, 70%. So which market do you want to be in? The 30 or the 70? The answer is the 70, okay? So don't forget that. Don't get locked into thinking this is all about IT. It is not about IT. It's part of it, but it's not the part. Um, in my opinion, I said this earlier, I would target outsourcers and I would target existing centres in CEE who are going to grow. I'm repeating that point to the, all the agency people. And the last one, I asked a friend of mine last night, I was waiting for Elias who didn't turn up, so I was sitting in the bar all on my own for like two hours on my own, and I just sat there and I wrote to five people, do you know anyone who's worked in Moldova? And one guy, a very good friend of mine, writes back, my brother has worked there on and off for 10 years five years, I don't know, 10 years, I think he wrote. Um, and, I, and so he gave me his email and I wrote to this guy and I said, could you tell me three or four bullet points if you were to summarise Moldovians, summarise it. And he wrote, people, he started, I didn't ask him a, a people, he said, people are smart, unspoiled and hardworking. Right? Now, I'm a shared services expert, sectorial expert, if you think, what am I looking for in our industry? Think of what is it? It's not about money, it's about people. I'm looking for smart, unspoiled and hard-working people. And this guy tells me this and he's nothing to do with shared services. So that's his description of you as a nation. You, should, you will lead in this industry. I can feel it. I tell you, we just need to get out there in the marketplace because we've got so many of the attributes you need to be successful. Okay? And that's a true story. Right, questions to Elias. <laughs> yes, Olivier. Wait, let me give you the microphone. Uh, thank you for your intervention. I have a question. You were saying talent, talent, talent. You said people, people, people. Yeah. But then you showed a very interesting chart. And unfortunately, I mean, this is the reality the population is very small. Yep. So, now you understand where I'm coming. Uh, for instance, I was already, and I'm not the only one here, because I've spoken with some friends, we were sometimes uh, blocked by this barrier of people, you know. Uh, giving a simple example, uh, I, I would have to participate to a tender where I need 250 people speaking French. I don't have them. It it's just yeah. doesn't exist. So how do you handle this kind of contradiction between, and how can we 
find solution to address those contradictions. Um, I, I'll, I'll, I have to tell he, you the story. He sent me the question. He's going to think, he's going to think, but I've got a really good story, true story. In Krakow, I opened the first centre, 96. In 97, I won a contract, and it had two Dutch speakers. I need two. I mean, two. How can you not find two people in Krakow? Come on. So, two people came for an interview. Two. Not 22, not 202. Two. One was really good, and the other was the worst interview I've ever done in my life. She did not want to work there. She wanted more money than I, I think. She had no experience. And what did I have to do? I had to hire her because I don't speak Dutch. She left it in three months. I widened my search. I found another Dutch speaker. But I agree with you, it wasn't 250. If they come and say, I want 250, they don't exist. Move on. Bye. But the language thing is, is the other thing with language is you cannot teach language in the space of two years. It's it, it, to get from no, zero, to being able to have a full conversation. It's not possible. But I can train you to be an accountant, a HR person, right? I can teach you that in two months. Because you're not an accountant, you're doing a piece of the accounting. So it is different, yeah? Yeah? I, 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 <laughs> So if, wait, if, I gave you some if thinking If I might add a point to that, and I was just looking at the numbers. Remember that I told you that even though the average centre size today across the cities where they land in our bigger uh, outsourcing region of Europe, um, the average is like 22 years ago. But I also told you that the variability between the big 2,000 plus seaters and the smaller ones, it has spread. But there's a contingent of the 200, 200 the less than 250. We counted them. And I think what is important is another aspect. Many centers in some countries, and I apologize, my dear friend, but call a spade a spade. I'm getting questions from people that say, we want to stay in the region, but we want to spread our eggs across multiple baskets. What I'm telling you that there are centers in the very mature BSC countries. Um, think of Spain. Think of Ireland. Think of Hungary, Poland, and the Czech Republic. There are centers that will keep their master center where it's at, but that are looking for an expansion of 100 people that they can over time will grow. So I, I, I think that and that's the power of the ABSLs. I mean, everybody wins if the project stays in the region. And there is stuff that clients will not do in Brno, that they will not do in Prague, that they will not do in Krakow, but that they like to do in the European playing field because they can send their smart managers to do a tour of duty, be it for a week, be it for a month. So I think that in order to grow, that is a very important strategy. Then also look at penetration rates. Um, I know that in West Lithuania, they say they got a very low penetration rate of number of people working in the sector versus total population. I take a different view on that. And it is true that IT talent is hard to get anywhere in the European Union. Oh, look, you're just a flight away from the European Union, so what are we talking about? I was in Lviv before the whole trouble started, and they spoke about Europe. I said, what are you talking about? You are Europe. Eastern Europe starts at your eastern border. And indeed, in those days, it was so natural for Europe-based companies to work with Ukrainian companies. It was natural. If it was natural for the Ukrainians back then, how much more isn't that natural for you today? So I, I think when you think about growth scenarios, you may not get your 1,000 seaters. And I would never dare to say to my client, I can get you 1,000 people in Chisinau in three years' time. It's a problem everywhere in Europe. So it's a problem here as well. But there is a timing factor. And like I said, start smaller. Not like uh, the majority of projects, if you count the number of projects, have a size of less than 250. And what does 250 mean? Some will say, I will need it in six months. Okay, even I say, no way, Jose. I don't see that happening. It's not realistic. You cannot transfer the processes, train them up, and be fully operational in six months. It ain't going to happen. But if they say 250, and they mean 250 over 18, 24 months, then maybe you do want to have that conversation. Question for Ramek now. I have a question. 
First of all, thank you. And uh, my question is about the, you told already, if it's not in custom service or if it's not about IT, what kind of operation, what kind of services are growing now or in your opinion, they can be interested for Moldova? Where we need to focus? Please give us an time. Right, and exactly, exactly what I'm saying, don't do that, don't. Because there's no way Moldova will be the, the center, the hub for Central and Eastern European anti-money laundering process, right? It's not going to happen. No, 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 no. What you need to do is grow by winning work and you don't care what it is. You don't care. Finance, research, HR, don't care, don't care, don't care. Do you know why? Because the more you win, it's called the domino effect. You win one, people go, oh, did you hear they moved to... To, to, to Moldova, really? Oh, let's go and have a look at Moldova. Oh God, two have moved. Oh my God, everyone's going there, let's go, yeah? And then they go, why didn't you tell me to go to Moldova? <laughs> and he gets told off. I don't think that the approach, honestly, I don't even think in the mature markets I would go there, but in an immature young market, specialising means you may win nothing for a long, long time. And that's crap. You have to win and you have to grow and you have to have more centres. The industry works on growth because it allows people to move and get promoted and move and get promoted and then everyone stays in the industry. And I go back to a key point. There is nothing in the back office that any company does that I cannot learn and therefore teach him and he can't teach you. Trust me, 90% of everything they do in the back office is learnable in two months, right? So... I, I think specialization is a very, very risky approach. I would, I would almost say no. I'd open the doors to anything and everything. Reverse, if they came and said, can you do a thousand people in AML, I would be very scared, yeah? There's a thousand people in, I'm exaggerating numbers, but a hundred in finance and accounting, you can do it, easy, easy. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you for your answer. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Let's make some applause for our key speakers and for an extremely interesting um, panel, discussion panel and a debate in a way. And thank you, thank you for all your advices, for all your insight. It was extremely interesting. And I would like now once again to thank, first of all, all of you that you stay till the end. Our um, first ABSL summit, it's practically ended. And now I would like to invite you all to a nice champagne and sweets. And we have a poor car, um, Rosé Brut, one of the best in the world, I can tell. Please join um, our catering area and let's uh, celebrate this nice event, the first event, the first Bursal Summit. And thank you once again to all the partners to GIZ, to Invest Moldova, to our key speakers, to our members. Once again, I want to invite uh, the community to join a Basel family. Thank you, thank you once again. It's a big step. We have a lot of work to do. Everybody is open to collaborate. Let's do it. Thank you.